Well done. Your lords and masters. Hello and welcome to day 11 of the Genesis of Androzani Advent Calendar for 2020. This time I actually used the, the day number to fit for what this video is going to be. Because last year we had a 10th Doctor debate on day 8, which was just a big mistake. It should have been day 10. I'm such a numpty on that. However, this time we're going to be doing an 11th so, so, so today we're talking about we're talking about Sylvester McCoy, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> I love the War Doctor. Um, <laughs> sorry, what was that, Mason? Sorry, I've, 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 I've already ruined your video. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so we're going to be talking about the Eleventh Doctor, which is um, old Spanky himself, Matt Smith. Uh, <laughs> and um, objectively, the hottest Doctor. <laughs> no, uh, there's at least three that are hotter than him. I think. Anyway. Um, yeah, if you've been on Twitter, you'll know that. <laughs> anyway, so we have... Um, today we have different from last time, because last time we had a 2v2 between uh, me and Callum and, and Joey and Dylan, but Dylan's not going to be on this again, uh, I think, because he just... I don't know, he just seems a bit exhausted of life at the moment. I don't know why. He, he also... I don't think he can be really bothered with the Matt Smith era, I think. Yeah, I know. He... I never heard him talk for, like, more than five seconds about it. I know, I know, I know. And, <laughs> also, and also, Callum told me that... Um, Whilst he enjoyed doing the video and ha and talking and having fun, he didn't really get much out of the last time. And also, I think Callum's a bit conflicted on this topic specifically, so it wouldn't really work. Because I need I need extremists for this. Um, <laughs> so this time we're, we're going to be doing a one v one, and I'm going to be the moderator. So on one side we have uh, Joey, who was here last time for the tenth Doctor one. Oh, oh, well, thank you, thank you. Yes, and we also have Mason, who hasn't been on the channel before. Yes, hello everyone. Yes, so these two Yankee Doodles are going to talk about the most Yankee Doodle Doctor. That's uh, true. That is very true. <laughs> yes. Um, and basically, it's got, the way it's going to work is we're going to have um, we have five different categories, and the way that I'm going to do it is as the moderator, I'm going to try and be as unbiased as possible in terms of the way I, you know, award the points. It's a bit like if you've seen uh, there was a, for example. There was a video between Joey and Dylan and Brian was the moderator of like Power of the Daleks versus Evil of the Daleks back mm. in the day. And the way that Brian would do it is he would choose, <laughs> I think from memory, he would choose based on who had the better argument. Um, I'm surprised that that video is still doing really well. That is still getting <laughs> a yeah. consistent amount of views. It's also, um, it's also out yeah. of date because don't you like prefer Power now, Joey? <laughs> Yeah, now I do. Yeah, so now, now, now I yeah. have flip flopped. <laughs> so, so, I, I, can, I can still probably make a convincing ar argument for evil, but I know in my heart power is better. Yeah. So if you were to do that video again, it would have to be Dylan versus Brian with you as moderator. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, so this is going to be a debate on the 11th Doctor, and the five different categories are going to be firstly, character and characterization, secondly, acting performance, third is the stories. Um, Four is the interaction with companions, and five, because last time we did the end of time for five, so I'm going to do something a bit different. This time we're going to do how he compares to other doctors and where he ranks, um, in terms of, like, yeah, in that, that regard. And, yeah, so, gotcha. and basically we're going to have, um, each, each person on each side is going to have their say for each category, and then after that's done, we're going to discuss it, and unlike certain debates that have been going on lately, we're not going to interrupt each other during the first bit. Okay? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, we'll see. <laughs> Glad we got that out the way. <laughs> also, I, I can't remember, I, I think we were pretty civilized on the 10th Doctor one. I don't think we, we interrupted each other. Yeah, 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 I'm not, I'm not talking about that debate, I'm yeah. talking about something very different. Oh, no, no, I, I, know, I, know, I know exactly what you're talking about, I'm just saying, like, compared, I think we should do all right. And also, um, even though I'm the moderator, there's a chance that there's occasionally I might step in and have my own say, but we'll, we'll see. I'll try, not, I'll try not to, I'll try not to sabotage, if I can. There's a chance, you see. <laughs> there's a chance. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to start with, oh, by the way, before we get into that, um, I'll just let all the audience know that we have polls in the description you can vote for who you think had the more convincing argument. Um, so yeah, there you go. 
I never even looked in on how that went last time. How did that go for the Tenth Doctor one? Well, if we have time, Thanks. if we have time at the end of the video, I could read out those results if you want. Oh, fun, fun, fun! All right, nice. cool. I'm down for that. Okay, so we're gonna start with character slash characterization, <laughs> and we'll st we'll start on the positive. So we'll go with Mason first. Your thoughts on the yes, the Eleventh so Doctor's character slash characterization? <laughs> Yeah, so I am a I am a quite the fan of the Eleventh Doctor. I think that his era is very interesting, and I think that the way he did, like the way he took control of the Doctor, was really cool. Because um, I'm also a fan of, I guess, the Fifth Doctor, and the Eleventh Doctor sort of feels like it's coming from the same place where it's this young this young guy who's also like 900, and then like later on, like thousands of years old or whatever. And I just love the way that Matt Smith took the character and like the way that um, eventually like the writers took the character of the 11th Doctor. Because like, because like to start off in 11th Hour, you see him, he's he's very like jumping, he's very jumping around, he's very excited, he's, he's acting like he's a child, basically. And then you, you, you could argue whether this was too soon or not. In the next episode, Beast Below... I feel like you really get to see that old man come out whenever, like, the, you have the argument with with the Star Whale, and I think that characterizing this doc, like this Doctor as <clears throat> someone who's like an old man trapped in a young body, I think that it's like one, it's a great like base idea, and two, I think it's executed not 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 perfectly, but it's executed really well. All right, is that is that what you got to say on that for now? I think so. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think so. And 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 I, and I love the little like, I, I love the stuff that Matt Smith adds to the character. Like, I know a lot of people think like the the bow tie is cool. Like, I I know like a lot of people think his like little characterization stuff is annoying. I think it's awesome. I, I think it's I, I think it's funny. I think it adds a lot of not not humanity, but it adds it adds a lot of individualism to the to the character. All right, Joe, your turn. He's a terribly conflicted doctor, isn't he? At least, on, at least on a writing level. Like, thinking of what, like, of what Moffat and, and other writers on the staff wanted to wanted to do with his character, it's it's sort of all over the map, isn't it? Because I appreciate the mission statement of a childish doctor. I think a childish doctor can really work. And when and when we dedicate ourselves to that childish, boyish, fun, bouncing around persona, it can be kind of fun if occasionally uh, teeth grating. Um, but every now and then, <laughs> every now and then, we want to treat him like like uh, like some of the oldest doctors out there. Um, some of the old, oldest acting doctors out there. Sometimes they want to give him like the intensity of Sylvester McCoy and and, um, and 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 the rage of David Tennant. But it's it doesn't really work, does it? It just comes across as, and I'm, of course, avoiding the word childish here. Um, but it comes across as just like a, a kid pouting, and it doesn't seem very. It's not terribly convincing, first off, because I mean, I guess we'll talk about acting later. But I don't think Matt Smith properly pulls off the more intense moments of his doctor um but as far as like uh, like, like i said like I, I could get definitely get into that into that boyish persona um but even that persona gets bogged down by like uh mason brought up catchphrases um you know the whole bow ties are cool geronimo thing it's it doesn't do much for me because it seems very forced it seems very much like we're trying to create catchphrases for the sake of catchphrases little character quirks not because they come naturally not because you just happen to write it in an episode and happen to stick because you wanted to to frame this character around little quirks that, th things that people could get on t-shirts things that, that are really marketable and that's what that that's probably my main problem with the 11th doctor it, it, a lot of a lot of what he does says what a lot of what he acts like is very forced in, in, in my opinion um and then of course you get into some of the later stuff where they, where they really dedicate themselves to the to the old man trapped in a young man's body persona after he loses Amy and Rory and I it doesn't quite work does it and I it, it's one of those things that I can't quite put my finger on but it, it's it's got to be so, uh, something to do with first off Matt Smith as I mentioned earlier it uh, he, he doesn't quite pull off that intensity or 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 the or the old man in a young man's body uh, situation that the Eleventh Doctor's in. But it seems to, uh, it has a lot to do with his interactions with Clara. But I know you have companion interactions as a later topic, so uh, so obviously we'll, we'll talk talk a bit about that later. But 
a lot of it just isn't convincing to me. And that's that's my main issue with the Eleventh Doctor. He's not completely awful. You know, there there are some moments where where that mix of of, of boyhood and being a grown up, you know, where, where that where that blends quite nicely. Um, like, like the Doctor's wife, I think that's a prime example of it. Um, but most of the time, it just doesn't work for me personally. I was just gonna say I am probably a little biased because I feel like in terms of personality, I am most like the Eleventh Doctor. Like it's it's ridiculous. Like it, it, it might just be because he was the Doctor in my growing like era. So like as I was growing up, like s some stuff with him would come out. Like right now, you can't see it. I'm talking with my hands. Like I'm moving my hands around mm -hmm. as I'm talking, and like I'm a very I guess chaotic person. I guess is a good way to see it. So I, I think I'm just biased because I, like, as a kid, that's kind of what I looked up to. So I'm just, I, I just like that in a, in, in a character. I have a question for you, Mason. Yes. What do you think of the 11th Doctor's horny streak? Mm. <laughs> I don't like, okay, well, let's, let's, let's go through this and, and like remind me if any if i'm forget if if i'm forgetting stuff the stuff at the end of flesh and stone where amy is trying to have sex with the doctor yeah i don't like that i i think that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's not that's even the doctor that's that's poor yeah. characterization and yeah characterization on amy's part. yeah, yeah. That, that's yeah and that's off. and that's not even him like it's something yeah. I, th yeah, I think it's, it's, i think mason's more refer i think mason's more referring to uh to him and clara <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, oh, okay. I, yeah i'm i'm seven. i'm more talk so obviously because you know we'll get into the companions but like the the most predominant horny streak he gets comes in series seven i think it's almost like it's weird it's almost like a um he almost goes so like a <laughs> if i want to say it a character arc <laughs> with his with his sexuality where in the in series five he's like no don't touch me and then um and then in series six when him and river like you know are starting to get to know each other more and he, they're about to get married he He's sort of, it, it, he's it, on the it, fence. It, he's on the, his sexual awakening. <laughs> yeah, he's on the fence, and he's still a bit awkward, but he's getting into it, especially in, like, Let's Kill Hitler. <laughs> and then you get Series 7, <laughs> and then you get Series 7, where you get, in Journey to the Center of the Tardis and Time of the Doctor, he spanks Clara, and in Nightmare in Silver, he says <laughs> something about, is it, like... <laughs> uh, uh, oh, a mystery wrapped in an enigma squeezed into a skirt that's just a little too tight. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I, I hate that. I hate that I know that quote on the top of my fucking head. <laughs> yeah, wait, wait a second. Yeah, so okay. Ma Mason, considering you're meant to be the defender, what's your thoughts on those bits? I will say I don't like the stuff with 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 Clara. I think that that was I, I think that was forced. I don't think that was earned whatsoever. Mm. Especially after the stuff that he just like after I will say it after the arc he went with River. Yeah, he got married to her. Yeah. He's cheating and, on his uh, wife. <laughs> and I'm not trying to defend the Clara stuff. I don't think that's good. And I don't I don't get the feeling that he moved on either because River appears in the series seven finale. She's still yeah, there. <laughs> She's still around. Like one episode after Matt Smith talked about Clara's skirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, the Clara stuff's not good. I like I, I love everything they did with the river romance though. Okay, we'll get on like, to that. I think when we get to I, when we get to I, the I, companions, I, we'll talk about that. Okay, but like I I'll, I'll say this. I I like the I like the romance with River. I don't like the stuff with Clara. I do think that was kind of ridiculous. Okay. Um right, so where should Okay, so I'm gonna start guiding the time on this one. We're still gonna another sort of ten minutes if we want maximum on this topic. So, um just trying to think back to what both of you were saying. It seems to me like you both seem to like the idea of the Eleventh Doctor. However, the difference being is is that you don't agree that on the execution necessarily. Is that what I'm getting here? Yeah, that problem with a yeah. lot of Doctors, isn't it? You know, every 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 head writer or showrunner going into it, any, any Doctor's era has has a pretty solid idea for for what their Doctor should be. But mm. when it comes to actually it that's that's where you run into trouble you know every every doctor has a very clear and distinct personality but when you bog down a, a, a childish fun bouncing around doctor with really corny cringy catchphrases and 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 slapping his companion's ass multiple times and <laughs> and and having this weird sexual uh, relationship with river song who who we only just met chronologically it's yeah. it's i don't know 
it's weird. It's really weird. It's so, so all over the place. So the, and I just can't do that. So the, fun, the the reason why um I think I make a pretty decent moderator here is that throughout my time on watching the show, I've been on both sides of this fence. I think when I was when when the, when it was first coming out and I was a teenager, I was more on Mason's side. I was very I was very big fan of the Eleventh Doctor, and then at some point, like. It, it just around a couple of years ago, I just started to scratch my head a bit, and I was like, this doesn't feel the same as it did before. And then it just seems like as the <clears> years <throat> go by, I just it just would slide down, you know, on my rankings. I, I, can't help, I can't help but feel like I had something to do with that, didn't I? <laughs> um, not, not, not a huge amount, but there was def- it was definitely um, in regards to the, the second category, which we'll get to after the... Um, I definitely you definitely pointed out some things I didn't notice before, but for the most part, it just came down to um, I think it was in 2017 when I rewatched uh, all of New Who, especially when I got to series six. I was like, this, "There's something about this comedy that, that just rubs me the wrong way, and I can't get into it's it." Some, just something doesn't work, and it yeah, and, and it is it is one of those situations where it takes a while to just pin it down just get it yeah just right. and especially because i was watching you who all in one block um and like i know we've already discussed this at length before but watching uh, chris fakelston and david tennant right before matt smith there's such like th- their characters are so do- like um what's the word um oh it's a fucking uh, intentionally directly like uh endearing to the audience if that makes sense like they are designed to appeal to an audience in a way that kind of makes them a bit too human which is part of what some people criticize about them especially tenant but i recall on that rewatch i was so just um i could sink my teeth into their characters whereas with matt smith he has a lot of idiosyncrasies which does make him a, a, a bit alien but i think that it reaches a point where he just becomes so distant for me that I'm just like I can't keep up with him. Like he he talks so fast, he um hardly ever looks towards the camera like in a in a sort of like um in the frame. He's it's almost like he's trying too hard to be different that it makes him kind of inaccessible for me to 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 watch. To, to to be shy and to and to like to to act like, yeah again just act like that boyish doctor that I keep yeah bringing up. because the, the, because, but you brought, and because you brought up an interesting point there that I wanted to touch on okay, go ahead. where you said that real you realized it mostly when you were watching it like within this big block of like doing all of the who at once and that is a problem a pitfall of binge watching isn't it when you, mm. when you when you come across a shift in writing that doesn't quite gel right it's immediately noticeable when you're doing it all at once and you just see that shift there and something doesn't quite sit right with you that's that's probably a a big reason why I, I, I'm not a fan of the 11th Doctor is is just that immediate shift where I used to be a big fan of the 10th Doctor. I mean, I'm still okay with him. Um, but, uh, but yeah, like, yeah, there is just a noticeable shift in his characterization. And even if you're a fan of the 11th Doctor when he first steps onto the screen, just that shift from series five to six is noticeable. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I recall specifically, um, like, in series five, there's hardly any darkness. It's all very... It's it, the entire series for the most part. He's very wizardly, whereas when you get to series six, they add, they add a lot of like I I would personally call it they almost Americanize his Doctor a bit because he just I don't know what it is about him, but he just he just that. he just changes for some reason, and he he feels bigger and more in your face than he did before, but in doing so, it makes him hard to watch for me and also the other thing is like ah oh, it's another thing that i can't quite put my finger on but he like to do with just the idiosyncrasies like i know i've heard people on a podcast before say that they like the 11th doctor because of those idiosyncrasies and something that they don't like about the 10th doctor is he doesn't really have them but then for me it's like but i i'm like i'm more interested in knowing what the characters' motives are and what they want and what they dislike and they're sort of in the moment I like to sort of be able to gauge what this character's um feelings are and whatnot, which is why I tend to prefer doctors that have a bit more like there's a bit more direction around their their character. Whereas with Smith, it's sometimes difficult for me to really understand what's going on. And I get that's the point. 
But the difference is, is when you look at alien doctors like Troughton or Tom Baker, it always feels like they're doing it purposely for a facade. Whereas a Smith, I don't get that. I don't get the facade. I only get it. To me, it feels a bit more like, um, he's, it's, it's too earthly. Well, it's, it's, well, it's almost like to me, like he's like, he's being a bit daft rather than being manipulative. Mm-hmm. Like he, he just seems like he's, he's actually not with it. He doesn't really know what's going on, which is not, yeah. not nowhere near as interesting to me as him acting that way to put up this sort of lie so that people don't know who he really yeah. is, which is what Patrick Trout did perfectly for me. You take you take alien as an adjective, and you and you take it so literally to the point where it it's he's he's not just alien to us and to our personality. He's alien to literally every little thing that he encounters, and it and it turns out not it doesn't make him it doesn't make him feel less human. It makes him feel just more awkward. Mm, yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, but yeah, Mason, do you have anything to like respond to that? Yeah, um, so I think I I kind of look at it differently because I I also binge watched most of New Who not 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 too recently it was a it was a few years ago but I think my thing is at that point in my like fandom of Doctor Who I had just kind of gotten used to the fact that like if it like if it's a different showrunner I should not like expect like similar things because like. I think I think like I think RTD and Moffat were very different like showrunners, and they did their characters very differently. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and like I think, and I'm I'm not going to say this is what's happening because you guys have like had time to like like sit on it, but for some people, I think it's just a it's not RTD, which is the problem. And I think that like for me, like I'll, like I'll just say it, like Matt Smith isn't one of my favorite doctors. I just still like him, and my thing is like it's very hard for me to compare doctors. Because they're so different, I like, I understand like, I understand like, that, but it's just like it's not like, like when I when I say it's like I when I say it's different, I don't just mean like because the shift obviously is there, and that it does create a sort of whiplash effect when I'm watching it as a binge. But it's not just that as well, because even if I watched Matt Smith after seeing, I don't know, like because it narratively wouldn't make sense to do it after watching something from Classic Who, like because it just wouldn't make sense. But there is something very different about him. I mean, I know you compared him to Peter Davison, but I would say that whilst they both certainly are on paper, the idea is like an old man and young man's body, the biggest difference between Peter Davison and Matt Smith, I mean, I know we're skipping ahead (laughs) to the comparing, which I'll probably have to cut down time on so that (laughs) we can compensate for this. But the, um, Mm -hmm. for me, the biggest difference between them is that what makes peter davison's doctor a young man well sorry an old man in a young man's body is that he feels like an actual old person a bit like the first doctor in a young man's body i know what you're trying to uh, yeah he feels like he can't keep up with others yeah uh, uh, even though he he does still carry the appearance and and the the mannerism of a young man but he feels like he literally can't keep up with everything else because he is that old well what i'm saying is is that it's he, he feels like an old soul in a sort of more person way like in the way that you expect based on what you've seen with the doctor already okay. having been old it's almost like i get what you're, i get what you're saying it's rather it's rather with matt smith he's trying to yeah. still be young. yeah because like with well with peter davison yeah. it's more like it's an old man with a 29 year old's body whereas with matt smith it's more like rather than it being an old man it's like an old like character like an old wizard you know it feels like rather than it being like william hartnell in a young man's body it's like i don't know gandalf in a young man's body or dumbledore or obi-wan but not quite as nuanced but like it's it's that it's a it's a much it's a much more uh obviously intended fantasy sort of fairy tale old wizard character rather than an actual like believable old man if that makes sense he's a lot he's a lot less believable for me and i think that is intended because i would say that that is more to do with the fact that for from what i can see i feel like matt smith's doctor his target audience is a lot younger than some of the others i feel like it's he's a doctor that's written that uh for children's imagination rather than you know <laughs> fucking miserable old fucks like us that want re- like realistic <laughs> characters except 
Except me. I, 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 except all of us are under 25. <laughs> yeah, I know. So, I know. Um, but I, uh, but, but I do want to hear a point that Mason made, though, in him saying that, like, he gets the appeal of Smith being that it, it's it's not rtd it, it, there, there is such a shift there and a disconnect mm. that someone who didn't like tenant or rtd would would be really welcoming of, of, of smith and moffat but i i think i might have a unique perspective on this because i i'm not particularly a fan of either davies or moffat or tenant or smith for that matter um like like to the point where like i'm my favorite scene in the end of time is the regeneration not not the not the moments leading up to the regeneration but once matt smith has come onto the screen i fucking love that moment um do you so so uh, to, so to counter that mason i think more of my problem lies within the character not not that it's no longer something that i loved that's fair and i think that like 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 the way you were talking about how like matt smith is more like a like like an old wizard in a young body i think with that like it's just down to taste like I, I, I find that kind of character appealing. I'm not saying it's. it's I'm watch. not saying it's bad. I was just. I was just saying that that's one of the big differences Wait. between the Fifth Doctor and the Eleventh. That's all I was saying. Oh, okay, yeah. Mm. Well, yeah, but like, like I, I like that, and and I think that it's it's a cool like I guess to repeat myself. I, it, it's just a cool way to take the character, and I, I think that most of the parties involved were able to execute it pretty well. Hmm. But then I think. But then I think it, 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 it's just down to preference, and and I'm not saying like you guys are wrong for disliking i just like it, it's just a difference of opinion well i mean I'm, I I'm, like I'm, it's, it's, i think there are moments where they do pull that off it's just i find that it's not it feels to me like that character like the when you get the moments where he is that old sort of wizard character it's not as it's not really his full-time character it's only in the moments when it's required Whereas, because the rest of the time, he doesn't feel that old to me. He feels quite young. And that's the problem I have, is it's not as consistent as I would have w- hoped. Mm. If you get what I'm saying? <laughs> like, it feels yeah, like... I, like, yeah, in yeah. any scene that has young Amy po- Amelia Pond in it, he definitely pulls that off. He, he's got the whole, like... The, like, a, the the old like the old wizard that... Um, I don't, I don't want to come off as, like, describing it as creepy or anything... But what I mean is, is the like the old wizard, exactly the old yeah, wizard exactly. that understands children. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like a, yeah. a bit like Gandalf yeah, and Frodo, like, or something like that. It's, it's it's along that line, and um, it's the kind of character where like he talks to children, and you would believe it. Like you would believe he would actually enjoy it, and not in a creepy way, and just like a genuine "I am a childish old man" way. And I think that's yeah. when they pull it off. The only the only problem I have is that when you you get rid of that element and he's just um and it's more week to week stuff a lot of that gets removed and he just becomes this really oddly sexual idiosyncratic awkward person and i don't really understand it well like i i i think that the the like the the old the old man that like gets children i think that's more consistent i think that like where it like where it like comes into combat is like it's this like nice character that like like kids would want to hang out with but he's facing like these really serious situations so he has to like shut it off because like if he were to come across like that like it, it it's not like trout where like he wouldn't be taken seriously but, like he would not be taken seriously and in those situations he needs to be taken seriously Joey, is there anything else you want to say on this specific topic Oh no! I said everything I, I, I want to say. I feel uh, like I covered all my bases. Yeah. Um, God, I'm not really sure. Uh, in terms of a verdict, I don't really know where to go with this one because I feel like it's just it, it, it. A lot of it comes down to how much you can suspend your disbelief. I think is the big determining factor. Um, yeah. Between yeah. them, it's, it's it's almost like <clears throat> can you actually believe this character? Because that's kind of where I feel like the part of the reason why I've shifted is that when I was younger, I could suspend my disbelief with this character. Whereas now when I watch him, I can't. And that's probably where where the difference comes. So I don't know, I'll give you both a point. Yeah, yeah I, I get that. <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, I know. Last time, last time we did this kind of debate, you know, we, we didn't like claim victors or anything because um, there wasn't a moderator, but. Mm. I don't know. Well, I mean, that was that was brought down to the polls, which we'll get to at the end. Um, Indeed. Indeed. Interesting. Okay, so that wasn't that wasn't as brutal as I expected. 
Um, I suppose that means it's either going well or it's not going well. I can't tell. Um, <laughs> it depends on what you're looking for, I guess. All right, let's, let's, yeah. jump, let's jump on to the acting performance. I think, Joey, you should go first this time, because I think you have some very interesting opinions on Matt Smith's acting. Hmm. Okay. Uh, huh. I, I like Matt Smith as, a, as an actor. I really do. Uh, <laughs> um, but for me, a lot of it just isn't convincing. I, cover, I covered uh, a few ba- of the bases here uh, last last uh, topic. But for me, it, it, it comes down to the intensity. And Matt Smith is just a genuinely goofy, fun, charming actor. And those are the kind of roles he plays really well. Um, you know, he, uh, he just plays a really fun person. Uh, and I, I, I don't get any intense moments from his doctor or, or at least like uh, from an acting pr- perspective, let alone writing. I mean, writing, I get wanting to write in intense moments for the doctor, but Matt Smith just can't pull it off for me. Um, he plays off, uh, he plays really nice emotional moments. You know, I love, I love him in Vincent and the doctor. I love him in, uh, at, the, at the very end of uh, Pandora or not Pandora. Uh, well, he plays that really well too. Um, that whole scared moment being trapped inside, inside the Pandora. Um, but the big bang, I, I love that, you know, moment there. It's really sweet with Amy. Um, and uh oh and the doctor's wife i mentioned before as well um he's fantastic in that episode but anytime he has to be really angry he just comes across as pouty rather <laughs> rather than rather than a legitimately intense guy that you should be that you should be scared of um prime example good man goes to war mm. you know the, the, the whole scene with, with uh with kavari and vastra and jenny i think someone else is there too i can't remember who um that whole scene comes to mind. Uh, what else? What else? What else? What else? Uh, 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 anything in Asylum of the Daleks? Mm. Um, there's that bit. There's that bit in Day of the Doctor that's been memed by Will Maddox. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you're talking about. Oh, my at the camera, right? He's not. He's not good at being angry, is he? He's, he isn't. He really isn't. The, it's, the only t- it's, it's a big, it's a big yeah. thing because when Moffat writes to his strengths, it really works. Mm. It really does. Um. Yeah, just re- just really like sweet emotional moments. I think those are the best. Middle ground is when he's fun and goofy because sometimes that comes across as cringy, in my opinion. Mm. And then just the absolute worst. Any any angry scene he has to play. Um, yeah, just uh, can't get into a lot of that. But uh, but for the most part, you know, I I think I think he's a, he's a, he's a great actor. Just occasionally miswritten, which I guess technically isn't his fault. But it's it it, it doesn't make his performance any better. Interesting. Okay, there's something you didn't mention that I'll mention after, but we'll go with Mason next. So, like, I will say, like, I mostly agree with you, Joey, about, like, how, like, he's mostly good. And I do think he is better when the madness isn't, like, like, over the top. Like, like I keep talking about it, like, that scene in The Beast Below where, like, he's, like, genuinely, like, upset with Amy about, like, whatever happened. I think he plays that really well. Like, this angry character. And, like, and then... It, kind of boils over towards the end and i i do take that seriously because i believe that that's like this character who is having to like face this impossible decision and i think matt smith like plays that like that uh, that concept and like that like the weight that that would have on a character i think he plays it really well and i i will say like sometimes yeah it, it can be a little over the top but i think for the most part like it seems like that and most of his speeches, I think he's able to pull it off without sounding like too comedic or like, or like accidentally comedic, but like, or, or like the scene with, uh, um, journey to the center of the TARDIS where like he's, and I, I know I'm in the minority and liking that episode, but like in this scene where like, he's like, he thinks he's going to die. He's shouting at like, uh, at, at Clara because he just wants to know who like she is. I can like genuinely see like, I don't know how long they'd been traveling together, but like I can see days and weeks of this question burning in the back of his mind, just like coming out full force. And then when, and then when Clara's just like, I don't know, I don't know what you're talking about. And, and Matt Smith is, as the doctor is like, Oh, okay. You actually don't know. And just like, okay, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to like, like unload all that on you. I think he plays that really well. And I, I just think like, yeah, I just I love his performance in scenes <laughs> like that where he's able to what what <laughs> no, what, nothing, nothing, nothing. I'm just I, fucking journey to the center of the target. I can't get into his performance in that, um, especially the whole bit where um where he traps like the crew uh, the crew people inside inside the TARDIS. I, I fucking hate that. Um, 
uh, you already mentioned the scene where he's like he's like berating Clara about like who she is. That I don't I don't find that convincing. Um, I would say oh, that Connor, I just re- oh yeah, I just remembered what you wanted me to talk about. Fucking Mister Clever, right? Is that it? No, no, that wasn't it. But yes, that is a problem. Oh. <laughs> okay, I will. I, I, I will. I will stand here and say I do not like Nightmare and Silver. I, I do think Mr. Clever is kind of... You know what really ir- it really I, irritates I me that. is that Nightmare and Silver for me is by far Matt Smith's worst performance, but then right after it comes his best performance in Name of the Doctor, which is really strange. Yeah, that is one of his best in Name of the Doctor. Yeah, yeah. He's, oh, he's most really definitely. I, I, I can agree with that one. But the reason why it work, I think Name of the Doctor works so well, especially with the intense moments, is it's not... It's not um, it's not excessive. It's really controlled, and I think that's where he's it's, at, it's at also, his best. It's also, it's also not necessarily him angry. It's more scared than anything mm. else, and, and he does scare. Yeah, too. yeah. So because now with with the moments where he's, uh, you know, the the idea is that he's an intimidating doctor. It seems to only really work if the person he's trying to intimidate is like physically smaller than him. So like someone like uh, Carla Jax or Clara. Whereas if it's if it's like in a good man goes to war where everyone is so much like stronger than him, it just comes out as really strange how they're all threatened by him to me. I'm like, right. I don't find it believable um, yeah. that they would actually be scared of this guy because he's not really that scary. <laughs> I, w- I will say, I do think that like in the good man, it goes to war. I think it's more just the idea that they're mm. scared of. And it's just like, oh, the doctor's here, and they ha- and they really haven't yeah. like had like time to be like, like, oh, the thing was, just this guy. the thing he's writing is it, it gets gets on this idea of the doctor is the doctor, no matter what he looks, sounds, or acts like. Mm. I but the, it doesn't entirely work when when you're when you're taking it on a on a case by case basis. When you take each of the incarnations at face value, like Sylvester so McCoy, no matter how he looks, he's a scary doctor. Like he he, he, he like just his performance. He's he's an intimidating guy, despite mm. how he looks and his stature. Matt Smith. Doesn't look intimidating and yeah. doesn't act intimidating. Well, because because the thing is, if we're going to go back to the comparison that Mason made with Peter Davison's Doctor, when Peter Davison's Doctor tries to be intimidating, it always fails, and the script is aware of that. Whereas with Matt Smith, the script plays it as if it actually is intimidating. That's the problem I have, yeah. is that I don't find that believable. Um, yeah, definitely. And and another thing I was going to say was... Uh, fuck, what was it? Oh, um... One issue that I have with Smith's performance, uh, specifically in Series 5, is that sometimes he doesn't feel like he's quite figured out the role yet. And I'm not saying that's the entire yeah. series. Like, there are parts where he absolutely nails it. Like, I would say Vincent... Ooh, that's, Vin- that's most of the series, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, but, he doesn't... Yeah. Well, Vincent the Doctor, long. he's really good in that one, I think. Um, yeah, yeah. And he's pretty good in the two-part finale. He kind of carries that story yeah, well, for me because yeah. I'm not. I'm that's, that's personally, I'm I'm not a big fan of the Pandora Copen's Big Bang. But my favorite thing about the story is the acting from Smith. Most definitely, but Hard to agree there. but for that me, great. when I get to episodes like Vampires of Venice and the Hungry Earth, Cold Blood, and the Beast Below, there's so many moments like in points where I'm like, he just doesn't feel that confident in his acting. And there's one um scene in particular from Beast Below that's pretty egregious for me, and that's when uh, I think Amy brings up like where he's from or something like that, and he has to talk about the time war. And when you compare that to, say, like, you know, the end of the world with Eccleston or Gridlock with Tennant, you compare those scenes, which I just think are fucking masterfully acted, and then you compare that with Smith, and he just... I know that the point is that he's kind of, like, trying to get away from that and trying to run away, but the way he acts the scene, it's almost as if the actor doesn't really know what he's saying. I don't quite know how to put my finger on it, but he doesn't... He just doesn't have that confidence that I feel a lot of other actors have. I, I, I will I will somewhat defend that bit about the time warrant in two respects. Uh, one, first off, Moffat clearly isn't nearly as interested in the time war as yeah. Davies is. But then why would you bring it um, up yeah. then? You know, so he's not, why would you, why would you exactly, bring it up Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that I can't really defend, but I'm just saying, like, those things don't come up often, so fine. Mm. Um, but as far as Smith's performance... I think the point being that the Doctor has mostly moved on from the Time War at this point. That kind of works, but yeah, you're you're absolutely right that he doesn't that he doesn't get across the the grief nearly as well. And the other thing is is that sometimes when you um you go in your head and you're like, oh, I, I I wonder what this Doctor would be like in this episode. I find with Smith, he's one of the least interchangeable Doctors because when I when I think about um, say for example, like um, I can't imagine Smith 
in the Family of Blood, like, you know, the very end of the Family of Blood. I can't imagine Smith in that. I could imagine Sylvester McCoy in that. I could imagine Christopher Eccleston in that. I could imagine Peter Capaldi in that. But I can't imagine Smith pulling off that same intensity that, you know, on the level of Tennant does in the Family of Blood. Then you've got something like, you know, like Heaven Sent. Again, I can't imagine Smith being anywhere near suited for that, something like that. But then, and, yeah. it's, and it's like, so because of that... The idea that you should go with is to play absolutely to the strengths of the actor, but then you get, like you said, episodes like A Good Man Goes to War, and they try to make him this intense character like the other New Who Doctors are, and I just don't think it works at all. I, I just find him yeah. so unconvincing with how intimidating he's supposed to be. Yeah. And the only like the only time that it kind of works for me is... Um, is A Town Called Mercy, and the reason why is because he's wrong... So I kind of, I'm kind of more convinced by, and also because he's against Carla Jax, who is a much smaller man and much more cowardly man than he is. But the thing is with that scene is that because he's kind of confused, that does make it a little bit more bearable. And he's not really, like, he, he's not really meant to be as intimidating as something like A Good Man Goes to War when he is actually, like, unironically meant to be like, you listen to me now, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. what I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mason, I, will say, like, like, I, would, I would like to hear more from you on this. Mm. <laughs> I, I will yeah. say, like, I think that, um, I think that the argument of, like, I couldn't see this doctor in this episode, like, like, doing this thing, I don't know how I feel about that because, like, it's always with episodes that are very clearly for a certain doctor. And like I, I know that I, obviously human nature was a VNA before it was ever an episode, but I think that it worked so well for ten and specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. And like Char character wise, for both seven and ten, they reworked it in that way. But what I'm saying is, is that specifically in the performance, when you look at like the last ten minutes, I can't imagine Smith pulling the, pulling that off for me. I mean, it would definitely have to be very different. You, it would like his the scene with Joan Redfern would often be off the, um, obviously have to be a lot different it would be a lot more like awkward and idiosyncratic than it is with 10 because of 10 it's very like forward and confronting and also you get the scene with um yeah. with the family itself you know where he doesn't say anything and he does all the things and i just again cool. i i can imagine christopher eccleston and peter capaldi and sylvester mccoy and you know even a couple of other doctors just thriving in that and i can't really see smith doing that and that's for me one of the biggest things that's kind of missing from smith is that they try to portray an authority that he doesn't have and that for me has yeah. a disconnect mm -hmm. but then it's more than that because in series five for example they don't go down that road of portraying an authority at all which makes sense because that's playing to his strengths but in that i still i can't quite put my finger on what it is but there's just something missing and I don't, I don't, it's, it's I don't, not, I don't yeah. know. It, it, still, it still feels incomplete because of the performance. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I just still finding himself. I just feel, and and, 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 the, and the writing feels like it's it wants to feel like it's playing to Smith's strengths in saying that. Oh well, Smith is still finding himself. So so we as we yeah. as writers, we will make the Doctor still find himself. But that yeah. doesn't entirely work because there there's no one making that first leap into a confident, uh, self assured Doctor. Well, because there's a lot of there's a lot of like surface level stuff. But the just in terms of like sinking my teeth into the character, I just, I just can't. I don't know why. It's this. There's, there's something about him that doesn't feel complete at first, and then once you get to later on in his run, and they do kind of flesh out his character. It just there's a lot of inconsistencies. There's, um, there's a lot of things I don't like about what they do with him, with like a lot of the sexual stuff, and I just, I don't know. I, I feel very confused by Smith. I will say though. If I were to point to an episode that I think absolutely nails his Doctor for me, it's the God Complex. I absolutely love him in that one. And the reason why is I feel like they actually gave him, like, a... You know, the, the way they characterize him is quite is a lot more fleshed out than it usually is, and that a part of that has to do with it's, I, it's meant to be my, climactic. I, despite, despite my favorite Smith episode being Vincent and the Doctor, I think my... I think my end-all, be-all Smith episode that, like, perfectly captures what his Doctor is, was, should be, um, whenever he's poorly characterized um i would say is the doctor's wife the doctor's mm. wife he's he's, he's, he's right in that one too. really good for him yeah yeah, yeah. he's right in that and, one and too i will say like I, i've never looked at matt's like i've never looked at matt smith's doctor as the kind of person who liked being like in authority so like whenever he would like try to do it i feel like 
it was coming across like as a character who's obviously like uncomfortable with the fact. I, I never saw that as like the actor. I, I just thought of it mm. as like how this doctor takes it, which because like he's like it, it's the end of series six. He's very much like trying to not be like the the highest authority because like he tries. To, yeah, like, I, I would I would even I would even argue at that point in saying that if he's uncomfortable with being the authority figure then that's even more detrimental because you're you're just you're just feeding more into that awkward uncomfortable doctor that doesn't have any self-confidence i don't know i, I think it, it's more like the i guess even though this isn't a smith episode it's like it, it's like the end of death in heaven where it's like i'm not supposed to be a hero i'm just this guy in a box going places and tr trying to help out like it, i i like it seems like Matt Smith is like the the doctor where it really came to his head where it's like, oh god, I've really become this massive figure and all See, because the thing is, history. it's like, everything you say on paper sounds great. It's just that I just don't agree that it's executed well. That just seems to be the running theme here. Is yeah, that that's fair. And, 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 and I do think it's executed well. So I guess, yeah. again, it's just down to taste with this sort of thing. Yeah. God, this is... Yeah. It's frustrating because I'm like I find it difficult to actually argue with you because I don't I just necessarily disagree with what you're saying. It's just that I just don't like the way that they did what you're saying. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, oh, it's tough. I because because I can like with Smith. Whenever I watch him, I'm like I can see why someone would like this, but I just I'm just like I struggle to really get into it. That's the problem I'm having. And like I can understand that. It's just like. For me, with with my personal taste, the way that I enjoy like consuming all different types of media, I I, I can get into it. So mm. yeah. Um, what else was I gonna say? I, I want to say something nice about his acting actually, because I do think he's a really good actor, um, overall. But uh, let me just think. I think I've said more positive about his acting than you, Connor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> okay, so I think the reason why I feel like the Eleventh Doctor and the God Complex works for me so well is not just down to the fact that I mentioned like it's obviously a very character wise, it's very climactic points. So they add a lot more meat into the character drama than they usually do uh, in the Smith era. But it's also down to the fact that he's. It's one of the few episodes where I feel like the Eleventh Doctor feels like he's in control, and I'm convinced by him being in control. It's not, uh, like I said, it's not like Goodman's Goes to War, where it's it's overly intense and not really fitting to his character. It's very him in, being in control of the puzzle at hand, and that's where I feel like he thrives. Is that he's in the God Comics? Obviously, it's inside this big hotel, and because it's him sort of quietly shifting around the place by himself and just sort of like being like, what's this? You know, I feel like that works a lot better. And also probably another reason why I like the God complex is that it kind of, uh, he kind of is a bit more self-aware of who, wh who he is and what he's been doing, which is, is a big shift. Cause usually it feels like the 11th doctor doesn't really know who he is to me. He, he feels a bit confused mm. over like, I don't really know who I am, but I'm just sort of darting mm -hmm. around uh, running away from all my troubles whereas with the god complex he actually is like you know what i'm a bit of a i'm a bit of an asshole aren't i like i mm, i've done yeah. i've done some pretty shitty things and um and also yeah. it's probably also down to the fact that in both god complex and a town called mercy at toby warehouse kind of had this like i don't know if it, how intentional it was but he kind of had this link with the 10th doctor which is probably why i like it so much because it's like it, it's 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 well, yeah, I, I, I get what you mean there because it because it takes the idea that the eleventh doctor is a doctor who's very much like wanting to leave his past behind and mm. in those episodes and in God Complex in particular it's catching up with him yeah and that like that vanity and that ego is still under the surface but he's he's trying to deny it but then he sort of comes to admit it and he's like you know what I think I think I've still got some issues and it's it's very subtly being like yes the time war is still affecting me but I'm just trying my best to ignore it which. Um, isn't Vampires of Venice also a Toby Woodhouse? Yeah, it is. So, so I think that I think they form kind of like an Eleventh Doctor trilogy of, of that of those feelings still there underneath the surface. Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, and I never it, realized that before. Damn, that's cool. Yeah, Toby Woodhouse <laughs> very much like yeah. he, he. It feels like he's one of the few writers that actually carried the character arc that started in series one all the way through to series seven. If you got, if yeah. you got what I'm saying. Um, and then he wrote the lie of the land. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, oh, we're not, but we're not talking about yeah. Capaldi today. So I um, 
but even though I don't like, obviously I've talked many times before about not many times, but a few times before about how I don't like the the time will retcon at the end of Day of the Doctor. But what I will say is I do like the fact that Toby Whithouse used this part of his character to sort of lead into Day of the Doctor because I feel like the fact that he's trying to run away from who he was as his previous life, and then in the Day of the Doctor he actually cut has to have the Tenth Doctor come back and come face to face with him. And especially with the prison scene, I actually do like that that sort of, uh, even if it's unintentional, was a nice lead into it. So that's one thing that I will say really positive about the 11th Doctor. It's probably my, it's probably one of my favorite things they even did with the 11th Doctor was that sort of, like, every now and then you got an episode that would reference his past and he was a bit like, oh, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to think about that. Um, yeah, like, I, yeah, like I, I, I love the line that the, the moment has in that, in, in that prison scene where it's like, the man who forgets and the man who regrets. I, I love that yeah. description of 11 and 10. Yeah. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. That is a very Moffat-y line, isn't it? <laughs> oh, I know. I, I know that it's I it's just it. dripping with those like shitty slogans that get tossed around all the fucking time. I hate it. It, it, it is like prime like Facebook Doctor Who memes group, but like I, I still think it's cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. So shall we move on? Because I think we've, we've sort of Te- teetered off the acting a bit. Um, Indeed, yeah, yeah sure. I'm, again, I'm unsure what what the verdict to give on this one because it's like, like personally, I agree with Joey, but I don't know. I don't know how much of this is down to just my perception of him, or it's down to the, an actual, you know, mis misdirection. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I might have to just let the, I, I might just have to let the audience decide on all of these. <laughs> I, I, I was about to suggest that actually. Should we even like bother doing like personal points and just yeah, true. leave it up to the yeah. yeah. We'll let, let the audience decide the verdict on this one. Um, <laughs> <coughs> right. Uh, this time, so l- last time we did this, we dawdled on a little bit too long for this section. But I will um, just ask. I mean, you can talk about stuff if you want to, but I would say try and keep this a bit structured. So the, the third category is the stories, I think is a very interesting thing here. Um, it's a very broad topic. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I, I will let Mason go first. So, like, stories. I'll, I'm just going to go over, like, episodes real quick. Like, like I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'll just, like, give general opinions. Me, me and Joey were talking before we did this recording, and we, find out, and, and we found out that I like basically all the episodes that he dislikes. <laughs> um... So like I'll, I'll I'll just say the episode except for Nightmare and Silver. Yeah, yeah let's, kick off, like, let's, let's kick off with some some common ground. Nightmare and Silver is shit. Mm. Yeah, I don't like Nightmare and Silver. I don't like Victory <laughs> of the Daleks. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't like the Silurian two part of that much. Mm-hmm. But like like I feel like with that like it's not like a a violent dislike. I, I'm just like kind of may on it. Um, I would consider I like it. I would I would consider it below average. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, I would. Um, I, I'd probably consider it like average or below average. So I noticed that you've so far the things that you dislike, you've brought up like Cybermen and Dalek stories, which is a very good point. Is that I feel yes. like personally, the like the Daleks and the Cybermen and even some other classic Who villains are part of one of the, my biggest beasts of the Smith eras. I don't think that they handled those elements very well. What do you think of Asylum of the Daleks? Because that's the only one you haven't mentioned. Asylum, I, I kind of like it, but like I, I see where people are coming from, and I do think the big like I think the biggest problem with that episode has nothing to do with the Daleks. It, it's to do with the divorce plotline with Amy and Rory, which I I I'd completely forgotten until before this recording. Joey brought it up again. You're welcome. But like, yes, thank you. I appreciate it. See, you're, it's, it's you're trying very hard to get me to dislike that episode. See, it's funny, Mason. Because of the four Dalek and Cybermen stories in the Smith era, Asylum is actually my least favorite of those four. Really? Yeah, and like, so, like I mean, to be to be to be fair, it's not it's, and, it's not by a big it's not by a big distance. To be fair, like <laughs> the other three are you know very close to it, but I actually mm-hmm. like the the reason why for me is that. Asylum of the Daleks to me is just I just find almost nothing about it to like there's so many things in it I don't like there's obviously the Amy and Roy divorce subplot there's the Oswin Oswald stuff that I don't like 
And then on top of that, um, I don't like Smith's Doctor in it. I don't like the way he's characterized. I don't like the way that when Amy is taken by, I think it's Amy is taken by the Daleks, he doesn't really show much in the way of conflict or aggression. There's not any really, like, and, and, and also it's the first time that the Daleks have appeared in New Who where the Doctor isn't really bothered by it. He doesn't seem like he's actually phased by the Daleks being in it. He just feels very like this is like any other villain. And that's a, that's a problem for me. Because I feel isn't like... It weird, isn't it weird that the next main Dalek appearance after that within the Dalek? The, the, the 12th Doctor reacts more strongly to the Daleks existing than, than Eleven does in a but also, But also, because the Day of the Doctor obviously features the Time War, and it's like right before this we've had a Dalek story where it's not really taken seriously. And that's kind of a problem, uh. I think. Um, okay. I, 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 I mean, I mean, that. obviously, when you take expanded universe into account, there are a yeah. ton of Dalek appearances in between there. But like, as far as like you know, like you know, it's always it always should be an event when the Daleks appear on TV. But you know, Asylum's got to be the first time that it's ever treated as like just another day for for the Doctor. Yeah, and I like I will give you that. I do think that like the reaction is a lot like less grandiose than it should be, especially with the fact that like at this point he still thinks that these people helped kill his entire species. However, like, what I will say, Asylum of the Daleks, I think, has a really good atmosphere, especially on the planet. Like, I love the scenes where, like, they're in, like, 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 they just snuck into this asylum. There are, there are all these bodies everywhere. And then you just hear, like, the cracking as, like, the, like, these Dalek eye stocks are coming out of their foreheads. And then, like, just, like, as, as Amy is slowly, like, I guess, descending into madness whenever she's, like, her bracelet was taken off and, like, the scene with like the dancing and, and oh yeah like, and like it's it's shown that the dancing that's cool is, the, dan- yeah, the, 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 that's the dancing's my favorite scene from that episode for sure that's fine but again like yeah. I, I think that actually i'm happy you brought that up because i feel like that scene in itself um it sums up a lot of my issues with a lot of the stories in uh the moffat era with matt smith especially in stories written by stephen moffat himself is that i feel like a lot of the episodes are they're like a collection of really neat set pieces compiled together rather than this like juicy overall narrative that's one of the biggest problems i have and it's probably one one of the reasons because like um the 11th hour is a very popular episode but me and i know joey as well have some hot takes on that one (laughs) and one of my biggest hot takes on the 11th hour is it just feels like Moffat compiled together a bunch of really cool set pieces and didn't really make much of a narrative out of it. And one of the biggest examples of this is, like, you've got stuff, like, you know, it's like, oh, there's a secret room in your house, it's in the corner of your eye. Like, it's that sort of thing where it, it, it's very instantaneous. It's, it's, it's all these, like, short bursts of ideas that, that play out in a scene. But... And, and then they just never come back around yeah. in the episode or in, or in any other episode for that yeah. matter. But there's, hard, um, there's, yeah, there's hardly sure there's, hard, there's hardly any examples of Moffat when he's writing for Matt Smith's Doctor where in, in the episodes where I feel like he takes this broad idea that he stretches across a whole episode. It, it all feels very, you know, in the moment. And almost like he wrote the scripts in order as they went. And that's something that doesn't really work for me because I personally, I prefer when you get an episode that has a lot more focus and it de- it sort of develops its idea that it, its core central idea rather than a bunch of a bunch of smaller ones that are strung together and i get why some people would enjoy that cuz you know seeing it's almost like when you go to a um, a circus and you get a bunch of small acts that are compiled into one show that's kind of what you get and i get the appeal for that because it makes it dynamic and it makes it like oh, there's constantly something different going on in every scene, and it kind of, with the attitude of the 11th Doctor being so scatty-brained and, you know, all over the place, it kind of fits that uh, nature of it. But I don't really... it doesn't That doesn't really appeal to me. I think that's... You know, I feel like you could have... You could have... Um, you know, Moffat could have put a bit more focus on some of his ideas and made them much bigger and much better than they were. And that's just how I feel about it. That's kind of my overall problem with a lot of the stories in Matt's errors, they feel very instantaneous and they have like ADHD and they, they are very in the moment and not really looking back or looking forward. And they're not really, there's hardly any, um, 
like linking. <laughs> there's a lot of stories I find in other eras, especially Davies era, where there's a lot of linking going on, especially when you come to like the start and ends of stories that they'll often link together. Um, and so that they'll com- they'll combine in this like universifying effect with like uh, the themes and the like um, all the details, and they they feel like this one big package of like forty five minutes or like an hour and a half if it's a two parter, and oh, yeah. I just I just don't get that with them off air. It just feels like it's a bunch of short bursts that are strung together, and I don't know mm. I don't know it's it's off putting for me. <laughs> I don't know. Like I, I, could, uh, I could, uh, I could have my my opening oh, yeah, yeah, statement on the, on the story topic that we've been talking about for like over ten minutes now. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Jai. Yes. All right. Um, so yeah, um, as far as stories go, it's it's probably one of like the um, one of the one of the biggest downfalls of, of the Matt Smith era for me, at least. Um, there are some really solid ones in there. Uh, to name a few, obviously I've mentioned before, Vincent and the Doctor is my absolute favorite. I love the Doctor's wife. Um, I'm actually a big fan of Impossible Astronaut and Day of the Moon. Uh, God Complex, I really like. Uh, Crimson Horror is a really underrated one. Um, girl Who Waited. And I surprisingly like Name of the... What's up? Girl Who Waited? Oh, Girl Who Waited, yes. Mm. Yep, Girl Who Waited. Um, and uh, Name of the Doctor. Knowing most of my other Who opinions, I probably shouldn't like Name of the Doctor, but I really like I'm Name the of the Doctor. I'm the same. I, mean, I, I, know we've talked about, I know we've talked about this before, Connor. I know. It's, it's, um, it's a, that is a, one of the weirdest episodes of Doctor Who. It's like, everything about it I should hate. And then I watch it, I'm like, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> um, but oh, actually, the, the, actually, that, one that, one that one that really surprises me about you is Angels Take Manhattan. Actually, yeah, that's another one that I'm surprised I like. I mean, really, I only I only really really like the Amy and Rory exit. I I, I do love that scene, the, that that whole sequence at the end there. Um, What's well, mainly to do with like the rest the, of the, the the performances and the direction. I like the oh yeah, the strength of that definitely. episode. Um, I love. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I love Karen Gill and Arthur Darvel in that episode. They're fantastic. Um, I can't get into the Weeping Angel stuff in that one. That's it's, it's a bit too much for me, especially the Statue of Liberty thing. But mm. um, but but uh, like back on what I was saying, too. as far as like you know, oh yeah, um, that's the other thing I was going to mention about Smith's era is that um, it definitely I would say from it's a little bit in series six, but it's especially in series seven. A lot of the stories feel very gimmicky to me. They're not really. Um, it, it doesn't have that like sort of Doctor Whoiness of like this is a a, a a bizarre concept that we're exploring. It, it's more like this is a Hollywood film genre you've seen before, done in Doctor Who, and it doesn't. It's not as um, creative to me as uh, a lot of the other eras in that regard. I find. Mm. Yeah, but uh, but in that smattering of good stories that I that I do quite like, uh, mo- most I, I'm not fond of most Matt Smith episodes. So we already talked about Eleventh Hour, um, Victory of the Daleks. Most people know the problems of that one. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Hungry Earth, Cold Blood. Obviously, Doctor Who and Silurians being one of my absolute favorites. Hungry Earth, Cold Blood does not sit right with me, though I have softened on it over the years. Um, oh, the Craig episodes, Lodger and Closing Time. Mm. Despise those things. <laughs> Fucking hate them, especially Closing Time. Because um, yeah, it has the side uh, men. Curse of the Black Spot. Um, another big one that I de- another big one that I despise is fucking the Rebel Flesh and the All. Oh yeah, people. that that's my um, that's my least favorite. That's, that's my least favorite Smith story is the as Rebel as Flesh. My, really? Yeah, I hate for, that for one. Me, it's, for me, it's, for me, my least favorite flops between that and um and Doctor Who in the Wardrobe. I hate both of those. Um, what else is there? Good Man Goes to War. I don't like. I like bits in Good Man Goes to War, but not many. Mm. Um, there's that scene where um I, that side character i don't know the name of dies that's a good scene oh yeah yeah yeah, that's mm. pretty good yeah um oh uh, let's kill hitler as well you know, oh i forgot about let's kill hitler no i could have got my whole life forgetting about let's kill hitler um one thing that i um, I, re- I recall when i watched your um your marathon joy one thing that i was really surprised you didn't have a lot of dislike towards was uh wedding of river song I knew you were gonna fucking say that. Cause I, yeah, cause, I'm surprised by that one too. Because uh, I, I can't stand Wedding of River Song. It's it, it's it has its moments. I I don't I don't like it, so to speak. Yeah, um, cause like it's just I'll I'll just jump in real quick. I think I think actually me and Joey have the same opinion on Wedding of River Song. It's it's very conflicted. Yeah, um, I think most of the most of the build up is fine. You know, I love 
I love um, how the whole uh, how, like time, you know, like like crashing it on itself when it is played out. I think that that's mm. really well executed. Um, is it? I, I like. I, I thought it was just a bit like um, a bit too slapdash for me. I was a bit like, oh, is what is like a train going inside a pyramid of Winston Churchill's wearing a toga or something. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's I mean, like yeah, it's stupid, it's ridiculous, it's out there, but it is meant to be the, like the backdrop of the whole story, and just to like throw those things out there and just have it like be the setting. I just of think the rest of the I episode. just think it's a, an absolute mess. Like I can't think of one thing about that episode that is just even remotely okay, focused. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, the Brigadier scene, I think that's a great scene. Okay, yeah. To be fair, but then yeah. again, that was ruined by Death in Heaven with Cyber Brig, unfortunately. Well, yeah, yeah, but, but but I mean, come on, we're talking about the Matt Smith era here. I think, yeah, I think that's a great scene. And I, and I think and I think Matt Smith actually plays that really well. That's that's the best so, that's the best uh, scene in the episode for sure. But yeah, it, but again it, but again definitely. but again it's so out of left field. Like it's it's he's it's all this. I mean I suppose it kind of fits like with what they're trying to go for with the whole like him messing around and then he gets interrupted by reality. But I just oh, I don't know. I don't like the way Wedding of River Song like treats its narrative. It's just so. I, I don't, because I get the whole idea that Matt Smith's Doctor is so scatty-brained and going all over the place, but I don't like it when the actual episode itself it takes that point of view, where the actual narrative of the storytelling is scatty-brained. That's when I find it gets a bit too much for me. Yeah, and, but, I, but to be fair also, I think most of that happens in the second half. Like, you know, when it's just all over the place. Well, as, a, as, a, make well, as opposed to when he randomly visits that Dalek and then plays chess with Mark Gatiss and then... Oh, uh, yeah, that, that's... That's true. That's very true. That stuff. <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's the thing is that yeah. like it's hard to remember what happens in that episode because it's just so messy. Yeah. I mean, like I said, like I, I'm okay with it. I just, I just don't really despise it. <laughs> right. Because I, because I, I again, like I was really disappointed by um, like it's all in a parallel universe. It's like, so why is this like Madame Kavarian not still alive in the real one? And it's like, what's the hell are the silence doing? What's the why do they have to get married? Why do they have to touch hands? And then you got the fucking tessellator, and it's like, look into my eye. Well, well, Madame Kavarian is alive in the real world. I know, but that's it, 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 I know, but it's yeah. so weird. It's like it's so inconclusive. <laughs> Ugh. Well, yeah. Oh, well, I, I, well okay. But well, me, me, my, my big Finnish adult brain knows that there is an answer to all that. Uh, see, but that's the thing um, is that I feel like Big Finish, you know, like whilst I appreciate when Big Finish like fills in gaps and does like expand on all this stuff, I don't like it when it's like you have to rely on Big Finish to get the answers. Oh yeah, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that was a defense for the story. You were just confused by the, by the Kavarian thing, and I would say, and I'm just saying, if you listen to Diary of River Song Series Three, it covers all that. Yeah, I've got to spend um, all this extra money. Uh. It's it's actually the best volume of River Song. I, I would highly recommend. All right. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I, I kind of I to do just, myself. Like, but again, Sorry, also, like, also going back to what I was saying about like Moffat being very instantaneous. The whole thing of um, I honestly believe that when Moffat did the whole thing in Impossible Astronaut of the Doctor being shot, I am genuinely convinced he didn't know what the answer was when he did it. But I don't think he... I agree with that. Yeah. I don't think he yeah. knew what the finale was going to do to answer that question until he got to writing Let's Kill Hitler. I don't think... I think we, I feel like maybe he had like 60% of an idea. Maybe. Well, I don't know. I just wouldn't... I just I don't... Like, I, I don't I, see how anyone could plan out that storyline and see that ending and be like, yep, that's that's going to be the end. That's the answer. That's convincing enough. That'll do. I just don't get that. Yeah. I mean, like, I mean, it does make sense in a broader, uh, like in a broader context. Like, like when you know all the answers, like Impossible Astronaut does make sense. But yeah, he definitely but did not just, know the answer to it. Like, but it's so it's, like, it's like as an, as a, as a viewer, as someone who's invested in the storyline, it's, it just doesn't, I don't see how you could be satisfied by the answer. <laughs> Like I just don't get oh, it. I, I'm, I'm not telling you I am satisfied by yeah, the answer. Yeah, I know. I know. It would make sense. I'm just. I'm, I'm venting. I'm going off. Um. um yeah, but like, anyway, I'm, if I would like, my list of stories I dislike to piss off Mason, um, hmm. <laughs> uh, Asylum of the Daleks. Um, that, I think that's where I left off. Around there. Um, Bells of Saint John. I, I don't know how anyone could like that fucking story. Oh. Um, <laughs> Journey, Journey to the Center needs no explanation. Um. This hurts. Rings of Akaten, I like. I do really like Rings of Akaten. The, the very end. I, I really don't like the very end. My biggest um, problem with Rings of Akaten but, is it tries to do character drama, but it's so corny. Like, the, yeah. the stuff with Clara's parents um, is just like, um, 
it was a perfect day and there was that one leaf that fell off that one tree to see that one person and it's it's just like ah, i can't stand this <laughs> i can't stand this um oh hyde's second half can fuck off hyde is okay when it actually c- carries the haunted house atmosphere but then it loses it about halfway through and the whole episode can fuck off and then there's journey to the um, center of the tardis <laughs> <laughs> yep, and then there's uh, uh, Nightmare and Silver. Hate that one. Yeah, and Dermo, please. Time of the Doctor. Oh yeah, is an absolute piece. Of that. Oh yeah, Time of the Doctor Ugh. can. Mason, what's your what's your thoughts on Time of the Doctor? By the way, I'm interested to know because I've been on. I, I, I like Time. Like I, I like Time of the Doctor. There are like some jokes I think that are not good. Like I don't like the Doctor being naked thing. Mm. I think that's kind of ridiculous. But I like this you idea. Mean that, you mean that thing that thing that lasts for like a third of the episode? <laughs> yes, exactly. But like, there's there's other stuff that's going on. I think, and that, like, I I don't think that like ruins the whole episode. There is, and I love this idea of him being I'm, stuck, or like, or like, not even stuck. He's just here because he knows he will be, and he's just like so much stuff is like trying to kill these people. He's like, all right, nope, I'm staying here, and I'm gonna try to save as many people as I can. There's one thing I will say. There is one Joker from Time of the Doctor I do really like, and that's when um, I don't like the bit where he goes bald. I think that's a bit weird. But the part where <laughs> the part where Clara says what happened to your eyebrows and he says no they're just delicate I did I did find that quite funny because Matt Smith does have very he does have very delicate eyebrows I thought that was I, that got a bit of a laugh out of me but that was a that was a diamond in the rough for that one <laughs> literally the only thing I like in Time of the Doctor is is Matt Smith's speech about about like you know uh, moving on and like. Um, the re- basically the, the exact the re- the regen scene you mean? What's up? You talking about the regen scene? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The regeneration yeah, yeah, yeah. Scene, yeah. That, that's my favorite I, scene in the I, story as well as the regeneration. There's some of it's a bit like it's a little bit on the nose, but I I will accept I'll accept it. I'll move past it. But overall, yeah. the regeneration scene I think is really well done. It's just the uh, the rest of the story I can't get into it. Yeah. Yep. I think it's just, just, I think just, it's just, just tack that regen scene onto the end of a day of the doctor. I think we'd be fine. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, it's funny. Cause like if we, if we, um, well, actually to be fair, I don't really like the regen scene in twice upon a time anyway, but if you had, um, the doctor regenerate at the end of the doctor falls and twice upon a time never happened, I'd be quite happy with that to be honest. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. As, as much as I, and I, I know we're not talking about that, but as much as I do like twice upon a time, I, I it would have been great if it was at the end of Doctor Falls. Also, if 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 the um the announcement of the Jodie Whittaker wasn't like you know after the tennis or something ridiculous like that, what if we actually found out in the show who the new Doctor was? Wouldn't that be I, always, so much better? I've always craved a regeneration like that, just like when we yeah, just because they always no spoil the main character's death. That's, it never that, makes sense. That's what I had as a kid when I saw Christopher Eccleston regenerate. I didn't know it was going to happen. Oh, that's awesome. the same thing here but, like, but i didn't know that's so, but i obviously i think we all know I, I i didn't watch doctor who until i was a teenager um yeah, yeah. so but, but I, I had no clue like what was happening in the show so yes i had the same thing that i closed in there i had no clue who was coming up next thing, so yeah i just that's, i just like it's i mean to be fair i did know that tenant was the next doctor because you know by that point it was like 2007 or 8 but um hmm. but i didn't know that regeneration was a thing so that was the only time that I was actually surprised by it, because I was like, what? What's going on here? Because I used to think it was like a James Bond thing where you watch the next episode and it's a different actor. But that's not what happened at all. Mm. It's actually a, a transition. Yeah. And so that was, the first, that was the only time, the only time I've ever watched Doctor Who and seen a regeneration and not known it was going to happen. And I don't think well, I'll... I, mean, I doubt I'll ever get that feeling again. Although, to be fair, like, to be fair, honor. there is Night of the Doctor. That's the, only, the closest we've been. That is the only yeah, other time yeah. I've been surprised by. That is true. Um, uh, to, to be fair, also I think I think if anyone were to ever try to pull off a surprise regeneration, it would be Chris Chibnall. Mm. Although, to, oh, oh, oh yeah, oh absolutely. Although to be fair, we have had a few fake out ones that did catch me off guard, like Stolen Earth and Impossible Astronaut yeah, and um, yeah. and Lay of the Land. Yeah, oh, but, but then you're just pissed off when they and Impossible nothing, Place. So. <laughs> oh, no, oh no, sorry, Impossible Astronaut. Yeah, I was gonna. I said I did say that one. Uh. Oh, yeah, so I, I do I do have one more thing like to say about the stories real quick. And it's something that I've I never hear anyone talking about, but it's always stood out to me. I think almost every time like almost every time the direction and the atmosphere is really good for me. Mm-hmm. I feel like the episodes always make me feel what I'm supposed to be feeling. 
I mean, like, it's it's certainly stylish. Like, I'll give it that. It's a style. Well, it's like, a stylish era in terms of its like direction for the most part. But that's you know. I think like there, there were there were more episodes in the Matt Smith era that like genuinely like made me like nervous or like well well no not 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 nervous but like well not scared either but like unnerved I guess what's well, kind of that like it's there, it's there, there were more scenes in the Matt Smith era that did that for me than basically any other era for, like I, at least I I now. do get what you're saying because it does have this like like on the surface level in terms of like the production and everything it is. It's it's really well made for the most part. There are certainly elements of certain episodes that I don't think are well made, especially like all all the green screen and Wedding of River Song is not well done. But um, like you do have a point in that the production values are very good, and it's not just like it's not just expensive like um, like the Chibnall era is because the Chibnall era is very expensive looking. But I think a lot of the episodes are quite dull uh, in terms of its style. Whereas with the Smith era, you know, the production values are enough to afford it to look really good. But like you said, like with the directions of the episodes, I do feel like there is a lot of artistic vision in it. And that is something that I do really like. The problem I have with it is a lot of the time that I don't feel it's, I don't feel that that artistic vision is fully utilized in the writing. And that's where it falls for me. All right. That's fair. But yeah, like, like anytime in an episode where like, I feel like I'm supposed to be creeped out. I'm creeped out, or like anytime, like I feel like that. Yeah, they always nail the presentation. I, I, I too, I too am creeped out when I too am creeped out at, at the Eleventh Doctor's sexual comments on Clara. <laughs> yes, very. Um, I get what you're saying though. Like, like if it was, um, if the silence appeared in a previous era, it probably wouldn't be nearly as scary as it does. Def- yeah, I don't think so. You know. Yeah. I, I definitely think. Um, <sighs> the the whole attitude of the show i don't i can't quite pinpoint what what quite what it is and it's i, I think it's become even more intense with the chibnall era to an extent but it almost feels like after davies left new who started to like really start to take itself quite seriously in some regard i'm not saying that there isn't like silly moments because there's, so, there's a lot of silliness in the smith era but what i mean is is that a lot of the time with like the villains they're a lot more like um there's there's a lot of there's a, for me there's a lack of irony with a lot of stuff after Davies if you get what I'm saying there's a lot less like self aware cheek and it's a lot more like kind of what you'd expect if you were watching another TV show where it's like this is meant to be unironically threatening almost in like a deadpan way does that make sense yeah and I, I definitely think Stephen Moffat would like. He was the kind of person who, like, as a kid, was told, "Hey, stop watching that silly show. Exactly. Go, 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 go do something serious." Because if you, it's like, because well, there's no, like it's my show now, I'm gonna make it serious. If you like, if you if you look at um, Russell T Davies, for example, you look at villains like the Slavine and the Rachnos and the the um, the fucking what's the the Sycorax and the the um, there's a whole bunch of examples of really like, you know, campy self-aware kind of cheeky villains that are like winking at the camera a bit like this is something that the kids will be you know a, a, a little bit threatened by but the adults can sort of laugh at and there's a lot of like there's almost a lot of um it's 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 kind of hard to really put the words on it but there's there's this almost sense of like the audience is aware that this is a bit crap and it's a bit like that with Classic Who as well. And there's this kind of charm to it. Whereas I feel like I never get that with the Moffat era. Anytime there's camp in the Moffat era, I never like it. I always find it obnoxious. And like, for example, like Mr. Clever is the prime example. It's really yeah. just, uh, it, it's not fun. I don't find it fun to watch. And you get like, someone like Madame Kaverian is, a, is for me a really bland villain. And the parts where she's, you know, playing it up, they're not cheeky. They're just... They're just annoying for me, and that's again something that's missing uh, from Moffat. I can sort of understand that, but like my thing is, and like I feel like overall I probably re- I prefer the villains of the RTD era. Mm-hmm. But the issue is, whenever you do purposely try to make your villains campy, it makes the villains not feel threatening. And I think the Moffat like villains, at least like they tried to make them feel threatening. Like the silence felt threatening. Like, like you could argue whether they were used properly, but like in that initial, like mm. in that initial story where we saw them, they felt like a threat that like was well, yeah. like screwing things over. When a lot, I, like, when a, when a lot of I, I do, I do like the RTD era. I just, 
I never, I didn't always get that with its villains. Well, because the thing is, is that w- one thing that, like, if I'm going to make a big comparison, because I feel like um, the Slavine and the Silence are almost on polar opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of how to, when you're doing a villain. And, and what I mean by that is that, like, the Silence are genuinely quite scary. I don't like what they do with the Silence in some of the episodes, to be honest. But in terms of, like, at its core concept, a villain that you look away and forget them and, like, the whole, like, des- the design of them with, like, the weird-looking bald alien thing in a suit, it's scary. But then... Yeah. But because I don't really like some of the way it's written, that that doesn't really land for me. Whereas something like the Slavine, yes, they are very camp and they are very, like, silly and they fart and they're, like, chuckling along. But where the Slavine, for me becomes threatening is a lot different to something like the silence because what makes the Slavine what I one of the things I like about the Slavine is the fact that they have such a control over the power that they can stand at that high ground and laugh at everyone else fail to take them down and that's something that I do like about camp villains is the fact that they are so overconfident in themselves that they that they become you know almost uh, in they become camp if that makes sense. It's like, All right, I can, does that make yeah. sense? Because I can see yeah, why someone yeah. would say that that like someone being camp doesn't make them as like violently threatening in the moment. But in terms of like a narrative, I quite like that. I quite like, I quite enjoy seeing villains that feel like they've won. And that's something that I actually, um, that's another thing that I really like about, um, something like the sound of drums is that the master's already won, and so he's just enjoying it. And again, it's like with the Moffat era, you hardly get any of that. It's very... Again, it's hard for me to put the words on it, but it's just... The villains feel like they played a lot more straight than they are in other eras. Yeah, I I definitely see where you're coming from. I I think it's also just an issue of... I think, obviously, RTD and Moffat are writing and are going for very different types of, like, villains. Absolutely, yeah. And I think, honestly, that doesn't mean that the Moffat era is bad. It's just that because because he takes the villains so seriously, it's like, well, that means you're going to have to really execute them seriously. And it's like... Yeah, so it is is more likely for your villain to fail if you are trying that hard and it just doesn't work. Whereas if you're trying to camp it up, you can still get some enjoyment out of that. Yeah, because either way it goes, you kind of get some level of success. It's either going to be, um, like I described, with like the overconfidence complementing their victory, or it's going to be, um, it's so bad that it's just hilarious and fun to watch. Yeah, you know? okay. Yeah, I, I can see where you're coming from with that. Yeah, whereas like, if, if a villain has taken itself like really seriously and it isn't that threatening, then you could you could end up with a bit of a disaster. You know, and like I will say, I do really like Hyde, and like I like all of it. But I do think, I do think, like once we see the villain up close, I I, I don't think they should have shown the villain yeah. at all, because because it's much scarier when it's like fast motion blurred in the background, and then you see it, you're like, oh okay, mm. and like it's it's still creepy looking, but then like but then the eleventh Doctor's like, ah yes, Romeo, look yes. at you, and, and it it's kind of devalues the the scariness and like I, I don't think it does it like immensely because I, I still like the scariness of the episode it just kind of devalues it a little bit so I, I i will give you that there's also two other things that i two other issues i have with a lot of smith stories uh one of them mm-hmm. is i don't find a lot of the side casts particularly memorable that's something that i really like about classico is that the, i find a lot of the side casts very memorable and um i would extend that to the davies era as well is that one of the things I really like to see in Doctor Who is when I get into a story, I can really sink my teeth into the side characters. And you think about stories like um, like The Impossible Planet of Satan Pit or The Waters of Mars or Silence of the Library Forest of the Dead or, um, you know, you go into Classic Who and you look at, you know, there's a, there's a whole bunch of them, like any story from season seven or, um, you know, there's so many examples of stories throughout Doctor Who where, like, they have really memorable side characters. Whereas I feel like with the Smith era, I find a lot of them forgettable. Um, and even if, even if I can, like, even if there are stories that do feature sort of a vast side cast, I find a lot of the side characters to not be particularly interesting. One of my peak examples of this is the the Angel Two-Parter from Series 5. I don't find any of the side characters in that story particularly interesting, to be honest. I just, they're just people that have, I, I, you know, I, generic I, traits. I, I, I do think the main like father pastor guy is interesting because he obviously has like this history of River where like she's in jail and we don't know why and like mm. 
I I think like that that initial mystery does make him interesting, and I do like the Angel Bob stuff. Whenever like like he, he he's just this kid that gets killed by angels, and then they use his voice. Yeah, I, I, I know. I get what, I get what you're saying, but if you compare that to something like um, Evangelista from Silence in the Library, she ha- she already has a fleshed out character by the time she becomes that, and then you get obviously in Forest of the Dead, you get the form where she sees Donna, and I feel like it's just so much more fleshed out. Whereas, again, like this is sort of broadly speaking, I just find a lot of the side characters of the Moffat era, I can't really take that much away from them. I don't really, I don't really. Uh, I don't really get much, and I think also part of that is probably because, especially later on when you get to like uh, series six B and series seven, there's not there's not really any two parters in the second half of the Smith era, and I think that might contribute to why the side cast get laid to the wade side a bit. If you get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, Hello. yeah. I can May I put in a formal um, request to move on to the next topic? I am very tired. Yeah, I can tell you're not really saying anything. The only other thing I was going to say is that yeah. one thing I really don't like about the Smith era is I don't like how uh how so many stories end with the power of love can't stand that i don't know i i, I, I kind of like it but i can understand like the repetition being kind of annoying also i really like the lodger and none of you are going to convince me i'm wrong that one ends in the power of love doesn't it <laughs> <laughs> yes as does night terrors as does um technically let's go hitler as does Closing time and many, 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 many others. Uh, let's move on to the companions. Uh, Joey, I should get you go first because you haven't speak, spoken in a while. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. So, <laughs> so uh, okay, uh, just, just to make sure we're on the same page with like, what we're counting as companions. We're talking Amy, Rory, River, and Clara. That, the, only four, right? Um, un- unless you want to uh, quickly stop on the Peter Noster gang, but you don't have to. <laughs> Cool, 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 cool. All right, so uh, Amy. Uh, okay, I I want to like Amy as a character. I really do. Um, Karen Gillan really distracts from, uh, from it for me, at least like early on, uh, because Karen Gillan isn't. Her performances aren't necessarily strong, and they're not very good at all uh, in series five. Um, I do like her and Vincent and the Doctor because um, I think her and Tony Curran are great off each other. Um, she gets better in series six. Um, I mean, like throughout the entire era, like her, her, and her and Matt Smith are, are are fun to watch off each other. But as far as like just Gillen's performance on her own, I can't get into it. Um, and Amy's character as a whole, I think I appreciate what it's going for. I really do, because it fully devotes itself to to the idea of the Matt Smith era as a fairy tale, and 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 Amelia is the girl within that fairy tale that that sort of fictional character that is everything the doctor needs in his life right now and it even goes past series five when you delve into um when you delve into amy being river's mother and everything and and like and and her being so important to the doctor's life that that she fulfills that role of a really important companion it's probably a little too important though in my opinion um i do like despite how short-lived it is i do like her in series 7a when uh and and this goes for rory as well when you see um, Amy and Rory's life, like you know, move move, move really uh, move really fast. Like you know, when the Doctor's not there, like their lives have to move on without the Doctor. But they keep getting dragged into it, and the fact that they keep getting dragged into it is what gets them killed in the end. Um, so that's the way that's executed, and that probably has a lot to do with, with what we talked about earlier with my with my surprising enjoyment of the Angels Take Manhattan. Um, and uh, oh, and I like uh, I like I, eh, like. I, I, yeah, whatever. I, I do like it. <laughs> I was debating in my own head. Um, I do like her appearance in Time of the Doctor uh, during the regeneration scene. I think that's quite nice. Um, Rory's fun. You know, Arthur Darvill's a really fun actor. Uh, Rory is, however, a bit of just the, just a plot device there for the most part. Uh, he, does get, he does get a character of his own in Series 6, and I do really enjoy him there. Um, he's really fun to watch, but again, just l- like most... Uh, like most Matt Smith companions, most new companions, for that matter, the actors are fun. The characters themselves could be fun to watch, but there's just not much there to grasp onto as far as the character art goes, and, and really getting in, in, in emotionally invested in, in what they're going through. River, then. Uh, <laughs> oh man. Uh, so <laughs> the consensus on Matt Smith companions seems to be on my end. I really do like the actors. I think they're really great people, and I think their performances are really fun, and they're having a great time. But River Song is just unbearable for the most part. Um, 
I like. I think we. I think we talked about it earlier. Or no, I talked about, about it with Mason earlier. Who did I talk about with it earlier? I do like Alex Kingston in uh in in uh in Let's Kill Hitler. Um, I like River in Let's Kill Hitler for that matter. Um, probably the only thing I like about Let's Kill Hitler. Come to think. Um, but most of the most of the time, uh, beyond that, and uh, oh, and Name of the Doctor. Her best her best one in Matt Smith era is Name of the Doctor. Um, but River doesn't, despite her being mostly an Eleventh Doctor era character. I, she, I, I, much like Rory, for the most part, she just acts as a plot device within there, and I don't, I can't get terribly attached to a character that's just there to fulfill a function in the Doctor's life rather than be an important part in the Doctor's life. Um, uh, should I do Paternoster next to Clara? I'll do Paternoster. Um, Paternoster gang is mostly just unbearable. Um, <laughs> uh, Vax, uh, the, all of them. I was about to take it on a character by character basis, but they're all just these awful character tropes and, and stereotypes that don't really not stereotype not the right word. Um, but tropes that, uh, that, that try to that try to make characters out of them and, uh, and and they just don't come across you know Vastra is this is this um, uh, this, this cool sexy assassin lady that, uh, that comes out of nowhere and um, and just seems and is emotionally distant and that just doesn't make for an interesting character to watch because you can do more with the Silurian um, who, who's a close friend of the doctor we've, you've, we've seen Random Silurians who've only been around for one story be more interesting characters than Vastra because Vastra is just so emotionally distant and so stuck in that one frame of mind that I can't see much beyond that. Um, Jenny's there. Um, Strax has the occasional funny line, uh, but for the most part, I really like Dan Starkey. <laughs> Once again, uh, actors are great. Characters, not so much. Um, and lastly, Clara. Um, I can't get into the impossible girl arc. I really, really can't. Um, again, uh, Jenna Coleman does, uh, phenomenal actress. Just, yeah, that, that, that's my opinion on the entire Matt Smith cast of companions. Great people, great actors. Um, just not too much. I mean, I guess there's a lot of thought put into the characters. There's, there's a lot of time dedicated to those characters, but we're not really furthering those characters and, and, and what they're going through. Um, yeah, because it seems for the most part that Moffat has taken has taken the idea that if you keep a companion around long enough, a la like Jamie McCrimmon or Sarah Jane Smith, you take uh, characters that stick around for a long time and the audience gets really attached to them, but you have to like put them through something as well. You have to see their relationship with the Doctor evolve Doctor over evolve. time. You, you, you kind of see it with Amy, but not, not really with anyone else, in my opinion, at least. All right, Mason, your turn. All right, let's see. Um, I'll just do the same thing that Joey did. So, Amy, um, I think that as a as a hook of the doctor crashing uh, uh, crash landing into this um, young girl's like backyard and basically like she takes him as like an imaginary friend, I think that's one of the, like that's a really interesting hook for a character, and I think it's really interesting to like have that like to have those opening scenes of like the doctor interacting with this kid who's like, oh yes like I like I, I like take me away from this horrible place like. Like basically like Peter Pan kind of like mm. take me off to Neverland. It is very Peter Pan, isn't it? Yeah, and th but then like the Doctor like goes away for like twelve years, and then she and then he like catches up with Amy at this point where she's basically lost most of her like childlike wonder, and there there are a little like a, a few jokes where it's like uh she was a what like like wasn't she like seven years old like twenty minutes ago but like. Beyond that, I think like they they do this like young girl has grown up pretty well, and then another two years pass. I do have a question for and, you, Mason. How do you feel yes. about the fact that Moffat reused uh, the same thing from Girl in the Fireplace for Amy? Because he does the same thing with Madame de Pompadour, uh, with the young girl growing up. I think it's I think it's a a good enough idea to be like reused, and I think that it's different enough to where like. It, like, because I I think like because because with um, the girl in the fireplace, it's very much just like a he keeps like showing up in her life as like this, like like almost like a reoccurring dream, whereas with Amy, it's almost played as like an imaginary friend, mm -hmm. like okay. like as it said in the episode. I, I think it's different enough to where it doesn't feel like it's treading the same ground. All right, then. Where, whereas it it kind of is. But it's it, do, it does. Enough, it, they both do share the thing of when he sees them when they've grown up. He's like, "Oh, what's happened here?" Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like you were a little, you were a little girl five minutes ago. Um, um, but yeah, like, and, and then like as the series goes on, 
I like how we like catch up with Amy as she's like about to do one of the most adult things you can do, which is like getting married. And then I like how most of her arc in series six and then in the first part of series seven is her dealing with adult shit. Like, like her, like wanting to have a kid and then having a kid, but like being taken by the flesh and then it, it gets all weird. But then like in her last episode, she's wearing reading glasses. So like, she's really growing up. And I, I just love this arc of like this, this young girl who has an imaginary friend and then starting to like grow up and then getting in the beginning of growing old with her imaginary best friend. And I think that like, it was a great place to leave her off right as she was going on that, like the beginning of like actually starting to grow old. Right. So I, I, I like Amy and, and I think Karen Gillan plays her fantastically. And as does um, the younger Amy, I, I forget her name, but um, Caitlin Blackwood. She, she does good. Too. Yes. I think F- she's funnily, actually fun, probably fun fact. Caitlin Blackwood is, is, is as old as Karen Gillan was in series five. Now that's why is she also um, Karen Gillan's cousin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think Caitlin, uh, it's Caitlin Blackwood. Yeah, is I think that, so. Is that it? I think so. I think she's the best child actor that Doctor Who's had. Maybe, I can't think of an alternative. She's certainly better than that. Who that kid was in the bloody flesh two parter? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Fine. Fine. I'll, I'll Daddy. Give you that. Daddy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Daddy. When are you coming home? Right now. But uh, Rory, um, I think Rory is interesting because uh, he's ve- he, he was very similar to, I guess, Mickey in concept, but uh, uh, like similar to the Amy versus Girl in the Fireplace, their characters go very different places to where, mm. yes, it is kind of similar, but I think it's played differently enough to well, where there's, like... There's one key difference between that is that amy yeah, a- amy goes with rory instead of the doctor whereas rose goes with the doctor instead of mickey so they are, the, yeah, di- the yeah. direction is the opposite in that regard yeah yeah and yeah it, it's different enough to where it's it, it's just as interesting and i really like rory i think he's he feels almost like an audience surrogate especially whenever he's like jumping in like in those few episodes in series five where he's like what the hell's going on and amy's like just j- just go with it it's fine and, and rory's like why does this say that I'm like your your jester or or whatever that line was in Vampires of Venice? Like I I think he has a lot of humor as to like as a character who has no idea what the hell's going on. And then like in series six and then series seven, I think that him and Amy have a good dynamic with each other and the Doctor. Um, I think in series seven there's a there's like weird jokes of like the Doctor and Rory, and I'm not sure why. But like be- beyond that, I think that the writing of Amy and Rory is pretty good. Uh, River Song, I, I already kind of touched on this before, but I think the romance between the Doctor and River is really good, and I think that it's one of this is like it, what? Sorry, I'm just holding it. In. I've got lots to say about that. I'm just keep going, oh, yeah. keep going. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll 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 try to move on quick so I don't like accidentally blow blow you up or something. No, that's fine. That's it's fine. One, it's fine. It's, it's one of the it's one of the only ways I think you could have done the Doctor falls in love storyline because so many people are, are are already against that idea, and I kind of am, but I'm okay. Be, like I'm okay, I'm okay with it in this sense because it's not just a Doctor falls in love with human, which I'm not a fan of at all. It's like. And and they meet in the wrong order. Like that's such a, and like it was based it's off um, time travel thing. He, he based it off what? the um, Moffat based it off the time traveler's wife. Yeah, which is I've which is which one of which, he, which he also based girl in the fireplace on. Mm, true. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's oh, that's cool. I I didn't know that. But yeah, I think that the romance for me at least works pretty well, and I like the I, I like that they met before he was Matt Smith, but they like, 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 like they fell in love as Matt Smith and Alex Kingston and Alex Kingston. But I like that river met him as tenant and then would later meet him as Capaldi. So we can get like that, like dynamic shift. I I think it works really well, but like specifically in the Matt Smith era, I think river works. And I think Alex Kingston is able to pull off having already gone through the finale while you're still in episode five. And I, I think she's able that to play is true. Like, Oh yeah. 
That is true. She, she definitely she definitely pulls off the like um the fact that she's out of order. I do think she she get she does get that pretty good. Anyway, continue. Yeah, and I think that like I think she has like a pretty good ending with um Matt Smith at the end where it's after she's like already done the library stuff. And I kind of wish that was where her character ended off, but it's not, but I I think it would have been a pretty good ending at least with her and Matt Smith. It is a good ending. Um Pat and Noster gang, I don't know. They're just kind of there for me. I think Dra- I, I think Strax is pretty funny. <laughs> you say Drax, when, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, they're basically the same character at this point. <laughs> um, but like, especially in the Snowman, I think he's I think he's actually kind of actually, really funny. Actually, on that thought, I do think Dave Batista could make a pretty good Sontaran, don't you think? Like, if there was like a tall Sontaran. <laughs> oh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway. That would be great, actually. Anyway, keep going. I love that. But yeah, and, like, the... I don't know, like, I don't dislike it, but they're not, like, characters I'm, like, clamoring to go back to. I, I honestly think, like, Vastra and Jenny are best in Deep Breath, honestly. Or or maybe, like, Snowman. I'm, I'm not sure. But, like, I don't know. They're just kind of there. I don't have a massive opinion on them. And when I was younger, I was really confused because I'm like, didn't Strax, like, die or something? And then Matt Smith was like, oh, yeah, a friend of mine brought him back. And I was like, well, I wish you would have shown me that. Oh, yeah. But it turns out it was. That's another thing I don't like about. That's another thing I don't like about the Moffat era is how no one dies ever. Okay, yeah, I'll I'll, I'll get Except for Danny Pink. He's the only one, I think, that actually dies. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. that's, That's the Capaldi era, to be fair. Yeah. And then Clara, yeah, there's only one season I like Clara in, and it's not Series 7. Mm. Um, I like The Impossible Girl as an arc. I just think that it was it was really, uh, it was a really bad choice to have that as the center of her character, rather than having her personality as the center of her character. Because she basically doesn't really get a character until, like, basically just deep breaths i guess and and like even then it takes a little bit mm. but like w- like what is there interesting about clara oh she likes watching kids all right <laughs> cool um fantastic all right so it seems like we seem we seem to agree on uh Peyton Oster going and clara so we can probably move past that um yeah but i think one thing i was going to bring up was is that um one thing i i think the thing that i most disagree with what you said personally is the Dr. River romance. And the reason why is not necessarily to do with Alex Kingston. It's more to do with Matt Smith for me. I don't really feel like Matt Smith suits romance. I don't really see that. I think the only time where I'm actually convinced of it is uh, Name of the Doctor, which just seems to be the exception of the rule in every bloody regard. But I just I just find their whole dynamic in Series 5 and especially 6 with the Doctor and River to be, I don't know, I don't really get it, uh, you know, we get episodes like Let's Go Hitler and Wedding of a Song, I just, I just watch them together, I'm like, I just don't get this, I don't really get what, what the appeal is here, and I get the whole thing of, like, he's meeting her out of order, and that, that part of it's interesting, for sure, but it's the actual personality itself, like, not, not talking about the time travel stuff, just talking about the actual romance itself, I just find it to be a bit strange. It's, it's very sexual, it's definitely that, it's very sexual. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just, I don't, I don't, I'm not really convinced by Matt Smith as a romantic lead. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's kind of similar to him when he's trying to be intimidating as an actor. I don't think he really suits romance, I think that's not really his field. Um, and... I definitely feel like River Song for me works a lot better with both Tennant and Capaldi than Smith. Apart from Name of the Doctor, she's pretty good in that with him. Um, and in regards to Amy and Rory, this is a difficult one. It's like it's gone back and forth, and it's sort of like when I remember when I was a young, I was young, I quite liked them, but then looking back on it recently, it's not really all that I remembered it being. And I think what you what you said again, like going back to what we said way earlier in the review about on paper, the whole idea of her, you know, her life being ripped apart by the cracks and the fact that he's this imaginary friend to her is a great idea. Um, and then, you know, the way it's her growing up, I like that. 
but it's just that week to week, her actual personality, I don't really get much out of for me, Amy Pond. I don't really... Mm. I, I struggle to... Again, I've said this word so many times, but I struggle to sink my teeth into her character outside of the overall narrative. I just find it hard to really get into all the different, like, the small details of her. And it's, for me, I, I prefer it when a character has got all of their nuances, like, um, you know, portrayed on every level. And I know that's not easy to do, but again, it's just, like, it's just my preference, and I just... Yeah, I don't know. It's 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 a tough one. I can't. I I never really know how to make up my mind on Amy and Rory. I think I'm just sort of unsure on them. The one thing I will say for sure, though, is that one thing that I do kind of have beef with is that I really, 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 really love their exit in the God Complex, and I don't like how um, the Angels Take Manhattan decided to change it so that it, rather than it being this sort of like mutual agreement and sort of this like yes, this is where we part ways. It was so like, no, 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 they must die. You know, they, mu they must I mean, be this. I, 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 I somewhat disagree there because the God Complex isn't really a mutual agreement. It's the Doctor forcing them away because he's scared of what might happen to them. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But I, I just, again, like, even if you did bring them back, I just feel like the natural ending for them would have been like Amy and Roy saying, nope, this is it. We're ready to move on now. You know, whereas in the Angel State Manhattan, that, 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 that's sort of the entire arc. There is it's them trying to constantly distance them, distance themselves from the Doctor, and then and then always being brought back in for one reason or another. Yeah, but then it just like and, 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 because they because Moffat chose to make it this big dramatic. You know, they die at the graveyard with the angels. I'm just like that's not really what I personally would have wanted from that. It just feels like it's um, it's trying to retread the same like gut punch that you got with stuff like Donna and Rose. You know. It's it's just too dramatic for me. I, I think Amy and Rory's natural exit for me. I would have preferred if it was a bit less like that. And that's just sort of how I feel. It's it's also a bit like how I prefer like Death in Heaven with Clara over Hell Bent, like massively. So yeah, yeah, oh for sure. Um, but yeah, that's just sort of how I feel. And um, again, yeah, that's kind of what I have to say. So uh, Joey, do you want to say anything based on anything Mason or I have said? Um, I mean, I mean, it's just sort of honing in on River. I mean, like, I think, I think there's an idea there. There, there really is, but it, she doesn't work particularly well off of Matt Smith. I think, I think I like River in most other mediums, but it's, it's this odd dynamic between the two of them that doesn't quite work. Like it, it's, I mean, maybe it mostly has to do with the actors too, because Alex Kingston, it, he has such different romantic energy off of Matt Smith, if that makes any sense. Like, like I buy Alex Kingston far more with Peter Capaldi than, mm. than with Matt Smith. It feels like a more mature relationship. And in it, it, w w with, with Smith, it feels like she's the mature one and, and she's like hitting on an actual child with, <laughs> with Matt Smith. I don't know. It just feels awkward. It, it, it doesn't work. Their, 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 their entire dynamic doesn't work except for name of the doctor. But even then they don't have a scene together until the very end. Mm. but as you said name seems to be the exception for fucking everything so i know it's really weird I don't, um, it's it's weird because like uh throughout the moffat era a lot of it is like i like the idea but not the execution whereas name of the doctor is i don't like the idea but i do like the execution yeah. <laughs> right <laughs> yeah. especially given what happened in that, that, that that's that's where the whole impossible girl art comes into play and i fucking hate that but like i don't know something about the way the episode does it just works i love the um, fact that it like the the answer to the question rather than it being oh what is the doctor's actual name it's um the war doctor was not in the name of the doctor and again like you'd think that that would be annoying because it sounds like some pretentious poetry but it actually fucking works <laughs> and especially especially because the acting is so strong in those last oh, couple yeah. of scenes like 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 matt smith like is saying saying not in the name of the doctor and and, and like as he's carrying clara and then the war doctor turning around it's such a great moment i, I, I know, love that entire I know, scene i know anyway going back yeah, to and, sorry we're we gonna say mason i was just gonna say yeah like, and like that's that's the scene where i think that he does like angry well because he's obviously very upset with his past it's very controlled but um going back to the companions again joey like again it just uh, we seem to be getting like running into a brick wall again of like it just it, it just depends on like how much we enjoy the execution of it, I suppose. Like um, uh, yeah, M Mason, how do you feel about Joey's comments about Karen Gillan's acting? <laughs> I mean, like 
I can I can understand where you're coming from, but like I don't know. Like whenever I watch it, I never really notice it. So it, it, it's hard for me to argue against it because like whenever I watched it, I just I I never noticed it. Hmm. Okay, I'll, so, like, I'll, I'll, I'll have something yeah. to say about this, actually. I think the biggest reason why I'm so, not not 100%, but I'm sort of in the same field as Joey in this, is the reason why is because I don't necessarily think she's a bad actress at all. I think she's really good. The problem that I have with Karen Gillan, especially in Series 5, is that in real life, Karen Gillan is a really, like, adorable cute person like she's quite an endearing person she's really nice and harmless and you know i in every interview i've seen with her she just seems like a really sweet girl and then you watch amy pond and she's this really like aggressive overly sexual like dominant like figure and i don't really think karen gillen is that like i don't really feel like karen gillen channels that convincingly for me because i don't really see her as that kind of person in real life and i think that might be part of the reason why joey and i might be slightly turned off by a performance because she's playing a character that's almost the complete opposite of a real life personality and that and it's it's a bit jarring do you, do you joey do you agree with me on this i do agree with that do you think a lot of the matt smith era is miscast mm, i mean i think it's more miswritten for me i feel like you could have you could have altered it to be a bit more fitting of See, I, the I, actors. I agree with Miss. I, I agree with Miss Written if we're talking about the Doctor, but Miss Cast, I, I would say for Amy because he, he, like I think I think Moffat had, had a very specific idea for Amy in his head and cast Karen Gillan, who I don't think can play Amy on paper, who can't play Amy on paper. Um, mm. Whereas Moffat cast Matt Smith as the Doctor and then wrote very un Matt Smith scenes. That's uh, true, yeah. Um, yeah. I just I just feel like Karen Gillan doesn't suit being a horrible person because she just isn't. And I'm not saying that Amy's a horrible person necessarily, well, but she does. Dis- she's a horrible person in series five, I'd say. <laughs> but what I mean is, is that there's things she does that are very aggressive that I don't really. Oh, I don't know. I'm not really convinced. I, I don't know how to. Again, I can't, I can't really put my finger on it, but it's. Oh, there's something about it that doesn't quite click. I feel like, I feel like Karen Gillan would suit a character that's a lot more like, a lot more kind-hearted, a lot less aggressive, a lot more softer and more sort of jovial and, you know, because if you ever watch, you know, interviews with her, she's just such a, she's just such a lovely, you know, little person. Doesn't really, you know, I never really, I've never seen her get angry, <laughs> you know, in interviews or like riled yeah. up. I will say I disagree with the fact that like Karen Gillan isn't suited for like an angry role because the two main things I've seen her in, which is Doctor Who and then like Marvel, like Guardians of the Galaxy, mm-hmm. in both of those she's playing like and in Doctor Who it's 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 to a much less extent, but it's kind of aggressive characters. Yeah, and in both of those, like I'm I'm very convinced in like the way she's portraying the characters. The diff- the- and I and like I, I will say. Maybe I'm like mis mishearing the way that you're wording the argument, but like, could you argue that like maybe that's just like, like for Amy, it's just like the childish demeanor of what she used to be being clouded by this angry persona that the that is like slowly trying to break through, which is why it's not really as convincing. I don't know. It's a good point, but I don't really know. It's hard to put my finger on it. This one scene in particular that I that sticks out in my head is the one in um, I think it's Cold Blood. Or might be Hungry Earth. I think it's Cold Blood, and it's like when um, when Amy and Rory can see each other on the cameras, and she just like insults him, and I'm like, I, I don't know. I, I just I can't like mm. I don't find it that like that believable. Like in terms of her <laughs> acting, I, I don't know. It's 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 difficult because I do think she's a good actress, and I think when they get her right, she's really good. Like I think um. For me, like, two episodes where Amy and Rory, in terms of the acting from Aaron, uh, Karen Gillan and Arthur Darvill are really strong, are uh, The Girl Who Waited and The Angels Take Manhattan. I think in both of those, the actors pull off the what they're trying to do really well. It's, yeah. It's yeah. just... There's just that phase where Amy is borderline just aggressive that I just can't get into. I don't know what it is. It's odd. 
and I also don't. I again, I'm repeating what we've said many times. I don't like the the sexual stuff with Amy. I think that's really poorly handled. Yeah. But that's probably more yeah, to do with the writing. I agree with that. That's probably more to do with the writing. Um, it's it's also not just the flesh and stone scene. It's also the fact that Moffat used that scene to set up all the character stuff in Vampires of Venice with Amy and Rory. And it's just I can't. <laughs> I'm so like, what's going on here? Thankfully, it's all, um, a lot of it's sort of made up for by Amy's Choice, I think. I quite like, I really like that one. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Amy's a weird one. Because I think, again, like on paper, there's some really good ideas there. And I think in some places they do nail it. It's just, like with the 11th Doctor, it's the week-to-week stuff that I just... Oh, I just don't think she really fits. It's only really the episodes where the where the, for me when Amy thrives is when the episodes really focus on her, and like on the very like heavy elements of her character rather than the ones where like because the ones where she's not the main focus I don't find her that interesting at all. I find her quite boring, to be honest. But Karen Gillan's good. She's always charming for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Rory's a weird one. I think Arthur Darvel's great. I don't like the whole he keeps dying thing. I think that was a bit silly. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That did get kind of ridiculous after a little yeah. bit. And I find I don't like. I, I'm not uh, not really a big fan of like the whole like him and the Doctor being competitive necessarily. I think in Amy's Choice it probably works better than other episodes. But in episodes like The Vampires of Venice and um, there's a few others. I just oh, I don't know. It's I can't quite pick my, put my finger on it, but there's just not enough nuance there for me to really get my sink my teeth into it. Uh, yeah, but that's all I've got really to say about that. I think we should probably move on to the last thing because we're running out of time. Yes, because I, I really need to leave soon. All um, right. So yeah. just quickly go over um, the fifth category, which is uh, how he compares to other Doctors and where he ranks. Uh, we'll go with... Um, we'll go with Joey first. That's the easy answer. <laughs> <laughs> very easy answer <laughs> um considering he is uh still right now my least favorite doctor <laughs> mm-hmm. uh there are things i like of course um but i guess the only thing that i you know occasionally struggle with is justifying him compared to my other bottom couple doctors um why do, why do you put um just to, uh, i'll i'll investigate a bit so i i'm gonna give a few examples um why do you think he deserves to be below... So let me think. I'm trying to think of who's at your bottom. So you've got... Around there, you've got, like, Jody, John Hurt, Davison, Capaldi, and Tennant, right? Around... Yeah, right around there. Okay, so... Yeah. I think... Uh, why do you think Smith goes below those ones, just specifically? Mm, okay. Um, hmm. I think Jody's Ooh, the most interesting, interesting one, actually, to talk about. Yeah, pr- I... <laughs> Um, okay, it's fine. Uh, um, in comparison to Jody, uh, first off, Jody has done far less egregious things, um, but that's that's more speaking on her strength than, than Smith's failings. Um, but, but but I mean, that's exactly it. It's just, it's just that you know, for for every for every time that uh that that Matt Smith has like made a really cringy comment or or or, or an oddly perverted sexual comment to one of his companions or a supporting character or oh I forgot something I've talked about this at all up to this point sexually assaulting a lesbian um oh yeah in, in the Crimson Hole that um for every time that one of those has ha- have happened like I, I can think of far less situations where where Jody has legitimately made me angry that like that this is how the Doctor is being characterized it's more. The, most of, most of the reason why he's down at the, very, at the very bottom for me is is his failings as a doctor compared to others. It's not so much that um, that I maybe prefer. I mean, obviously, I prefer Peter Capaldi as an actor, and I prefer John Hurt as an actor. Um, but uh, but but it's more that it's more that Smith fails more often in his characterization, and characterization is the big thing. And I, I you know sort of bringing it back around to how this how this debate started. You know, mm-hmm. it's. It's it's all down to down to those little quirks that are throughout, like and that that appear at least once in almost every single one of his episodes. Well, because because um, a lot of the big argument for Smith over Jody is that he has a much more interesting setup for his character than Jody does. Like he's a you know the whole idea of him being a madman in the box and um, Amy's a mar- imaginary friend, blah blah blah. Whereas a lot of people would argue that Jody doesn't really have that launching pad for a character. She's quite bland. Like how would you what would how would you say in in regards to that? Oh. I would. I, I mean, I would, I would argue in Jody's defense in that in that case that 
But I would, I would argue first off that I'm so happy that she doesn't have a very specific not not um story arc to go on. She and 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 now that, and now that series twelve is there, to, you know, no matter despite how I feel about series twelve, she has the direction for her character to go on. But Smith's character is entirely formed around the story that is going throughout his era, whereas Jody's character is the driving force of her era, and the stories happen around her character. Am I making any sense? I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> you don't sound entirely convinced okay I mean, i'm not trying to like convince you of anything but like i'm just trying to make some sense of, of how i'm feeling about this um how can i word it differently i feel like because here's the thing jody isn't terribly far above smith for me um well because for me she's not terribly far below smith because jody's my least favorite and smith's just above that and i I often, the reason why I put Smith over her is because I just find, when I look at their stories and their, 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 their characters, I feel like Smith has more going on, at the very least. I sort of, I'm like, yeah, there's there's more to, you know, grab from here, whereas with Jody, I'm like... More going on. Smith has more going on, going on, but I always appreciate a back-to-basics approach. Um, right. Okay. I, I, appreciate it. I appreciate a soft reboot. I appreciate just, just the want to tell a story and not make it this gigantic arc. Um... Uh, you know, you, you know, and and Moffat being so proud of himself for 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 having different parts of his timeline like weave in and out and and and, and pop up in random places and and have the the time, timelines happen in the wrong order with River Song like just just tell a story, go a place, introduce some characters, tell a story, move on. Um, okay. Obviously, you know, if I wanted to like you know come up with faults for that, you know, obviously there you know stories aren't long enough for the Jodie Whittaker era, but the, the, you know, obviously this is uh, this is me discussing. Um, Jody's failings. This is just me discussing why I would prefer her over Smith. And it's, again, it's not a huge difference. Um, they're they're right next to each other as far as my doctor ranking goes. Um, but yeah, just you know, it, Jody has Jody has done less to annoy me in her era than uh, than uh, than Matt Smith has. All right, okay. So Mason, you you give your thoughts on where Matt ranks amongst other doctors and like how he compares to them. Well, that's actually interesting because if I were to make a list. Matt Smith would probably be towards the bottom, if I'm being completely honest. But the issue with that is, like, I don't want to, like, call Matt Smith, like, one of my least favorite doctors, because I still really like him, obviously. Like, I've been debating this for, like, two hours now or whatever. Mm. And it's it's because of that where I've, I've just been, like, I, I've just decided, like, I'm not going to try to rank the doctors, because I just like all of them. And, I mm. yeah, for sure, I definitely like doctors over Matt Smith, and there are some doctors where I like Matt Smith over them. Yeah. So actually but I like, was going to touch on that. Like what doctors would you say you like Matt Smith more than? Um, I feel like I, I like him more than Jody right now, I would say. Okay. And in my mind, he's about on par with, and I'm, Oh God, I, I, I don't know if I should say this, <laughs> but he's about on par with Tom Baker in my head. Ooh. <laughs> Jesus. But Ooh, okay. I really like I really like Tom Baker and I really like Matt Smith, so that's not a bad thing. Okay, at least for me. Interesting. So um, Tom Tom Baker ranks yeah. low for you. That's that's interesting. Well, Tom Baker Tom Baker ranks fairly low for me too. To be fair, I mean, as far as like uh, like comparatively with you yeah, know, but in, I would say he's he's more days. like he's more like in the middle of your list, Joey. To be fair, rather yeah, than the bottom. Yeah. Like, but, I, but I would say, but I would say, like, if I was like splitting it up between eras, like you know, he's he's uh, Tom Baker's like right where like Jodie Whittaker would be, you know, like comparing classic, uh, classic and new Who doctors. For me, it's just a matter of like, it's literally just like a uh, everyone's tied for first place and then everyone's tied for second place. Like it's it's just it, saying that they're like towards the bottom doesn't mean anything because they're still like really high in my list of like doctors because i i just like all of them right i so, feel like overall i probably like smith more than john hurt maybe i think probably i don't know so you so you like smith, know, you like smith more than jody and you like him possibly more than john hurt and sort of on par with tom is that what you're trying to say yeah it, it's very difficult because it, it it really just depends on like what doctor who i'm experiencing because like I just listened to Shadow of the Daleks, and I'm like, oh my gosh, like, like Peter Davison is now one of my new favorite doctors, and this happens right. every single time. Yeah, okay. And it's never consistent, is it, is, so it's just, it's, uh, it's hard for me to rank. Are there any other doctors that you would put down that low? Um, 
I don't know. Like I, I, I don't like to call it down that low because like it's still okay. But like, but like, but like around that area, like, like, is there any other doctors that you could possibly be like, yeah, I like Matt Smith more than them? Probably not. Okay. If I'm being completely honest, which is weird. Cause like, yeah, that basically tells you everything you need to know about like my doctor rankings. Like I just spent like two hours talking about how much I like the Matt Smith and, and, and Matt Smith eras, but like, I still like other doctors more than him. Nice. So yeah. Okay. So yeah, I suppose that was a bit an inconsequential of a question. Um, yeah, it's very hard for me to answer that. Yeah, for me, it's it's interesting. I think when the Matt Smith, Smith Smith era came out, he was my second favorite, and now he's my second to least favorite. So he's shifted a big, <laughs> big way. Um, it's actually kind of similar for me because he. I, I think he used to be my favorite. He's he's definitely not now. Mm. So, so Connor, according to your theory, that means John Pertwee's your second favorite doctor, right? <laughs> no, but but um, <laughs> but the, yeah, that is an interesting theory. I've I've found a lot of people have Pertwee and Smith on opposite ends of their lists because they it's are true. very it's different true. doctors. They are so different in a lot of ways. It's uh, actually interesting. I've never thought about that. Yeah, like oh, um, yeah, put some time into it. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting how like they are. They do contrast quite a lot in terms of their approach. And I think that's probably why they end up on opposite ends of a lot of people's lists. Uh, but yeah, so God, this is a bit of a weird one. I don't really know if we've really come to much consequence here in this video. I feel like we've just talked about what's happened and then said that some of us like it and some of us don't. Yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm a very true? passive like arguer. God, I'm we need we need we need we, we need a bloody Callum in here to be like, nope, it's objective. <laughs> <laughs> what does Callum think of the eleventh Doctor? I don't know this. Conflict, I think. There's, I think there's a lot of conflict. I know he. I know. Okay. He, like he. He loves. I know. So, so, so he's just. He's objectively conflicted, Connor. I have no idea. <laughs> I. I know that oh. he. Um. I. I know. Like I saw him do a ranking. I think he put him quite high, but that's probably mainly because he hasn't seen that much classic here. Um, mm -hmm. I know. Is, is, isn't it like the, isn't it like the only Sylvester McCoy story he's seen is like Silver Nemesis? Yeah, yeah. I'm like, mate, you got to watch some more <laughs> oh, than just that. God, no. <laughs> yeah. Watch more of all the fucking story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, 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 gave, other ones. it gave him a really bad like first impression. But I'm just like, come on, mate. Just we just wait, wait till you get to like Remembrance and Curse of Fenric and Survival and you know, or, lit or, or almost literally any other Sylvester McCoy story. Yeah. <laughs> Delta and the Bannerman. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, no. To be fair, though, McCoy's not terrible in Delta and the Bannerman. No, and I, I will stand yeah, he's by fun. this. I still well, like he's, well, he's not bad in Silver. Now. He's not bad in any of his stories, really. It's just oh, the no. stories themselves. Mm. Um, but um, in terms of Smith, um, I know that Callum lo loves Series 5, hates Series 7, and I think he also doesn't like Series 6. But he ranks Smith quite high anyway, so I'm like, I'm, I'm a little bit confused by it actually. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. One might say, one might say it's objectively inconsistent. <laughs> I, I think, yeah. I think with Callum, it's more so like, subjective. I think with Callum, it's more like he really likes the actor, but not the way it's written in the later half. Inconsistent writing. <laughs> right. So shall, <laughs> shall we read out the poll results for the tenth Doctor debate from last year? Yes. 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 Uh, let's find it so Evan Calendar 2019 God, it feels weird saying that year it feels like it was ages ago <sighs> I can't remember if I watched the 10th doc I, I, I think I watched most of it I mean it's 4 hours I wouldn't blame you if you didn't yeah <laughs> yep. alright so let's have a look here okay so the poll results for the Tenth Doctor debate between me and Callum versus Joey and Dylan. Um, so the first question was who gave the better argument about character slash characterization, and the results were oh closer than I would thought. It was sixty percent for me and Callum and uh, forty percent for Dylan and Joey. So it was quite close. I, I, I mean, I, I know given your audience, you, you're, you're, you're gonna, you and Callum are gonna fucking win every category. But... I mean, we. I mean, technically, we only won by one vote. Because we, we got th we, we got three votes and you got two votes, so nice, it was pretty nice. close. It was pretty close. Yeah. Um, and then the second one was about acting, which was surprisingly actually quite close. Um, 
it, there was three answers for this. There was, what do you think of Tenet's acting? For me and Callum, it was great. For you and Dylan, it was good, but the comedic quips are annoying. And then there was also an, another option for bad, which wasn't, you know, I, either of us. No one voted for bad. Uh, 75% for me and Callum, 25% for you and Dylan. Mm. Uh, then you've got the stories, uh, which were me and Callum's answer was a lot of great, some average and a couple of bad ones. And then you and Dylan were mostly average with some good and bad. And it was a hundred percent for me and Callum. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. So you- well, Hey, at least that means we won the last two categories. So, uh, so I'm curious to see the percentages. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so then it was who gave a better argument about the companions. Uh, Mm -hmm. so me and Callum was Rose is flawed. Martha has a beautiful arc and Donna is top tier. And then for you and Dylan, it was Rose is a horrible bitch. Martha is shitted horribly and Donna is fun. (laughs) And the, the, and the results were 75% for us and 25% for you. Wait, I thought you said you got, you got three of them and we got two. No, that's not what I said. It's not necessarily the same amount of votes. Some people would have voted on some and not others. Gotcha. Yeah. And then there was the end of time, <laughs> which was the final category, which Dylan exploded on. Um, for me and Callum, it was, it's flawed, but it, its highlights make up for a very emotional, enjoyable conclusion. And then you and Dylan said it's one of the worst ever. And the results are 80% for us, 20% for you. Uh, so so yeah so you guys did win in every category <laughs> yeah we did um i wish i wish there were more votes though there's only like a few like less than double digits on everything uh and then there was who gave the overall better argument and it was 100 percent for us mm. so a bit of a landslide i would actually mm. be surprised if for this video like i i i did the better argument because i think joey's a lot better at like saying what he thinks <laughs> It's it's weird though because also, like there wasn't actually that much arguing. It was just disagreement. <laughs> yeah, because I like I I like I like Matt Smith, but I also dislike arguing about like I dislike passionate arguments. So then why the like, hell? Then why the yeah, hell did you come on this video it. then? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's I, I, mean I, I, I also like I also like clocked out for the second half of the video. Cause yeah. I'm really fucking tired. Yeah, fair enough. Really have to the only other question really we asked in the straw poll was, yeah. what did you think of that video and? Uh, two said they loved it, one said they liked it, and no one said it was okay, I'll never do this again. So that's good. Mm. Um, okay. All right, so, God, anything else we want to say before we wrap up? Uh, did, did we call out our channels yet, this video? Go ahead, if you I want. Forget. Oh, I mean, oh, yeah, I mean, uh, just, I'm assuming you'll have them linked in the description. Um, mm-hmm. uh, Security Kitchen Productions, uh, we do uh, audio drama adaptations of Doctor Who novels, um, audiobook readings, uh, the Celestial Podcast, which is just a general Who discussion podcast. Um, uh, what else? Uh, commentaries, commentaries for Who stories, mostly classic stories. That's a lot of fun. And uh, I think that's about it. Am I forgetting anything? Oh yeah, uh, the the monthly Star Wars review. Um, but most people don't come to the channel for that. So if you're interested in that, there's that. Um, yeah, consider subscribing. I don't know if you want to. <laughs> All right, Mason. Oh jeez, my cha- um, I post um videos of me talking about whatever I want to talk about. Usually it's books. Sometimes it's Doctor Who. Um, I, I do have an ongoing series on my channel where I make video like. I, well, I, I guess vlogs for my little sister to watch when she's older. It is mainly just for her, but I, I, I have found that some people are actually kind of interested in that little slice of life thing I do. So if you're interested in any of that, check out my channel. I am very inconsistent with uploading. I'm trying to get better at it, but right now especially, there's just a lot going on. But I'm going to try to get back into it more. So, yeah. All right. Yep. Yeah, I'm absolutely exhausted, so I have nothing else to say. Um. <laughs> I'm Same here. bugged from this. <laughs> That's fair. So I think it was an interesting discussion, but I don't really feel like it concluded on anything. It's 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 frustrating because it's kind of like it's literally just are you convinced or are you not convinced by it? I think is the main thing. So tell us if you're convinced and if you're not convinced by it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure there were... Oh, uh, God. I'm sure, that, like, hopefully at some point we find someone that's not as nice as you mason i i want to i want to see someone that's really horrible like talk shit about us uh, and i'll dislike yeah, it 
You yeah, know? next time you have to team me up with someone who will like full on scream with you, like like scream at you, because then it'll just be like. Yeah, but we don't know. But we don't know any Moffat era stands. So Mason, find us. Something. I know a lot, but they're but they're like me, so like they, they'll be nice. Either that, or they just don't want to be in videos, which yeah. is fine. Yeah, it's a difficult one. All right. Well, thanks for joining, and we will see you all tomorrow for day twelve. Yes. Yeah.